holy crap. People persist in doubting the evidence. Don't run and hide. Don't be afraid. Don't turn away any longer. The truth will set you free. You're listening to Jimmy Church fade to black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. We're turning all of our antennas towards the Jimmy Church on Dark Matter Radio. <laughs> and now, your host, the captain of conspiracy, the prince of paranormal. This ain't your daddy's radio network show. This is Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. That's the sound I make after a big swig of bean. Ah. Lip smacking. All right, everybody, let's go. It's Fader Night. Yeah. Man, it's Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses. Today's Thursday, September 4th. 246 days into the new year, live from the JP Motorsports Studios, right here at the gates of hell, Burbank, California. For KJCR on the Dark Matter Radio Network, I am your humble host, Jimmy Church. Let's get this one cracking. Everybody ready? Is everybody ready? Fade or not, sound off. Fade or not, sound off. Fader not sound off. <laughs> Texas present. I see it. Maryland. Fader Knights. Logos. Let's go. Man, I'm jacked. Big salute to the proud men and women in uniform. Without them, there is no free speech. Protecting that constitution of ours, this great country. Welcome to everybody listening around the world, all across the United States, up and down, hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, far and wide. Let's get this one cracking. <laughs> I dig the new logos. I really do. On Twitter, that rocks. Thank you, Jeremy. Very, very cool. Kit is in the house tonight. Yes, and my husband is actually listening with me tonight. Say hi. Say hi. What's up, Kit? All right. Uh, Two friends have birthdays today. Two friend friends, like friends. Two friends have birthdays today. Two big shout outs. The first to Wasp Frontman. Bass player, rhythm player, lead vocalist. Kind of did it all in that band. Still does. Blackie Lawless is 58 years old. Chris Holmes has been on this show a couple of times. Really, really close friend of mine. Hours. uh, Slept on my couch for a couple of years. Good dude. Great dude. Uh, Both are in Europe. Blackie is touring Europe. And uh, talked to Gina Zamparelli today. And uh, by all accounts, probably his best friend, Gina. And she said, hey, I'll pass it on. I just talked to him. He's in Europe. So there you go. But happy birthday, Blackie, 58 years old. He's like the first rock star I met when I came to L.A. He was like the first one. Him and Chris, actually. Okay. All right. Uh, Let's see. And check this out. Kim Thale. Kim Thale, guitarist for Soundgarden, is 54 years old. The original, (laughs) the original, uh, the original Seattle slacker guy, Kim Thale. Um, When I was touring with those guys, I remember the first show, and I had never really heard grunge. 
and we were, oh, where were we? God, I want to say we were in Phoenix. And uh, I haven't even opened up the lines yet, and calls are coming in. Okay, I'm going to put this. I'm going to put this one on hold. You're just going to hang, whoever this is. So let me get through some stuff here at the front of the show. Um, I was in Phoenix, and and I'm listening to him tune his guitar to like C, gong, 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 with his beard. And I was used to that Hollywood Sunset Strip, big hair, Aquanet, spandex, synchronized everything on stage. And I just didn't get it. I was like, man, this is going to totally blow. And like two weeks later, I was stage diving. (laughs) I got Soundgarden. I got them real quick. Happy birthday, Kim. You taught me a lot about life, my brother. And uh, there you go. 54 years old. All right. Wow. You know, we wrapped up third Reich week. Blaze of Glory last night with Jim Mars. Excellent show. Jim is always good. And so uh, with that, tonight is Fader Night. Got so much to talk about tonight, and I can't wait to get to the phone calls. And, uh, yeah, somebody just got the message, and they 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 didn't want to wait on hold. They hung up. And I think that was a New York number, too. Who would have been calling from Manhattan? Huh. You never know. Thank you, Jim Mars, for last night. And uh, Joe Fex for this week as well. And Harry Cooper on Monday. So we'll talk about all of that tonight. Uh, i got a few things I want to get out of the way. First off, Twitter. It's already lit up. Uh, what was it called? Um, I have it in my notes. Um, it was called It was called Twibbin. Twibbin. That new program that is changing everybody's uh, fade or not badges for them <laughs> for Twitter, and uh, and I'm looking. Some of you got the message tonight. Some of you didn't during the day today, but I'm looking at the, all of the new logos. And so there's going to be some people in Twitter tonight. There's going to be you know a hundred on one side, hundred on the other, going, "Hey, wait a minute. How come how come everybody's got the cool new fade or not badges?" Well, somebody retweet. I don't know, if Jeremy, if you're listening, but uh, somebody retweet the Twibbon program that will take you straight to the Fade or Not page, the Fade or Not badge page. And what it does, it combines your picture, your Twitter picture, with the Fade or Not badge. So it comes out as the combination. It does, it's not going to be the same as everybody else's. It's going to be a combination of your picture and the fade or not badge. So check that out. It's okay. Look, for everybody um, uh, uh, that I only look at names. I don't look at the badges. I don't look at Twitter pics, thumbnails, whatever you call them. Uh, I don't. So, But what would be really cool, and I'm looking now, North Dallas, Nate Sugars just checked in. I'm looking at Nate's picture. He's holding up a fish. There he is. But Nate's looking around right now, probably going, everybody's got these really cool fade or not badges. Well, that's how you do it. You go to Twibbon and uh, get it done. Somebody tweeted. Leslie just tweeted it. Okay, there it is. Hey, Les, um, do, a, do a description of what that is so you can tell everybody what it is, what that link is to. Okay, so that's what's going on. Very cool. Really dig it. Thank you, Jeremy, for that. Uh, you do want to follow us on Twitter, though. You really do. Yeah, really do. At J Church Radio. Hashtag DM Radio Net. Come hang out in the sandbox. Somebody said the other day, what's the sandbox? And she was in it. I was like, you're, you're, where do I go for the sandbox? She hashtag DM Radio. She's right there, right in the thick of things. And asked me where the sandbox was. I I loved it. I can't remember who it was. All right. Facebook is jimmychurchradio.com. That's the fan page. Cross 7,000 fans. Pretty cool. Cross 7,000. I guess the goal, you know, where you can kind of just sit back and relax and all of this is like 10K. Let's get to 10K and everything. Let's see what we can do. It's like a, it's for fun. Because once the show started, we started with zero all the way around the, the, the board. Well, close enough. I think we had like 
44 Twitter followers on the first day. Um, is uh, it's 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 all the all the hurdles have been have have been jumped. But I, I just I like that 10k number, don't you? Wouldn't it be cool? Just 10,000, 10,000, 10,000. Because today on YouTube, I couldn't believe it. It just like caught us by surprise. I, and I, I went over to YouTube to uh, do some stuff and and uh, and straighten some stuff out over there. And I looked up and we were at 4,994 subscribers. I was like, wow, that is cool. Maybe we can cross 5,000 by the show. So I tweeted and did did whatever, and boom, sure enough, 5,000 and, well, I don't know what it is now, but 5,000 subscribers on YouTube. It's incredible, considering we started off at zero. I didn't say open lines, but I'm taking your call anyway. You're live on Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on Fader Night. Who is this? Hey. Hey, buddy, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I thought you said you could call about five after. Uh, this is uh, Steve from Western Kentucky. Hey, Steve from Western Kentucky. How are you, man? Oh, it was yeah, 8 o- good. Yeah, you, you're, you're an hour early, but that's okay. Oh. <laughs> that's okay, brother. That's okay, <laughs> brother. Dude, I'm sorry. Well, it, it's funny. Yeah, um, at the bottom of the hour, we're going to have on Bob Rutherford from uh, the Dallas Moore Band. And... He oh. he uh, tweeted out to everybody this morning uh, uh, that it would be 7.30 West Coast time, 4.30 East Coast time. I was like, dude, you're three hours in the wrong direction. I was like, let's go. Oh. <laughs> I just I'm laughed. Feeling, I'm feeling this pain, but I'm sorry. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. So um, uh, now um, I did ask you to call in. And, um, well, actually you wanted to, uh, uh, well, let's clarify for everybody because they're wondering now what's going on. Is this some staged call? It is not actually you, oh. you wanted to just, um, uh, this is my friend, Steve Asher. Everybody say hi to Steve. Um, Steve wanted, he goes, man, you gotta, let's just, you and I talk paranormal on the phone. I was like, man, just call into the show. Let's do it on the show tonight. You know? And so, um, and, and the reason why, um, you know, Steve, I've known you for a while now, but, um, and we've been Facebook friends and so forth, but, um, it was what you said in your message to me that raised my eyebrow, which was, you've got some paranormal stuff about the penitentiary. And so before we, before we get to that, that's the subject of the show tonight. I want the scariest place you've ever been. That's what we're going to do tonight with uh, Bob Rutherford when he calls in at, uh, or, I, or we call him at 730. So we're going to do that. And so, Steve, uh, you've got about two, three, four. We can do five minutes before I got to, I, I have the whole intro of the show to get through. <laughs> so um, Again, I apologize. Yeah, no, that's all right, my brother. That's all right. So tell me, uh, tell everybody, share us, um, a couple of this uh, penitentiary, state penitentiary stories. Well, uh, well, first of all, let's not. It's, I have uh, had, well, I guess a little bit over ten years. I'm a ten year veteran of uh, corrections, working in uh, working in the corrections field, and uh, I'd worked in minimum security. And for a part of it, and then I went over to the uh, Kentucky State Penitentiary, which is the maximum security uh, facility in Kentucky, houses all the death row inmates and all that. And um, it was just another animal. It was just, it was, uh, you go from, uh, you know, mainly code checks and things like that to like serial killers and things like that. It gets a little, it gets a little dicey, you know, uh, just in the people that you deal with and, and, and the level of security. But as of, uh, you were talking about the paranormal aspects of it. Um, it was a thing where um, it was, it was little small things that you would know this Um where uh, where I first started noticing things, I would work in a, a place called Four Cell House, and that was the general population area. And I actually ended up uh, working in the, one of the control rooms, and that has cameras. It shows all the different floors, all the different stairways in the back, and all the different uh, high-risk areas. Right. And um, so 
anyway, so I'm sitting here working, and uh, I understand this is middle of the day, okay? Because, uh, uh, you know, had people ask, okay, well, could it have been this? Could it have been, it have been that? But what I was doing is I was sitting there, and I was looking down on what was called, uh, it would be 11 left, because it was severed. It was, because it's a penitentiary. It's an old building. Uh, 18 mid 1800s. It was a uh, penitentiary. No, it was it was serious. I'm already and, uh, I'm anyway, a, I'm already creeped out. By the way, so <laughs> it's uh, yeah. I'm telling you, it's it's a strange animal, and um, you know, I I had dreams about it to this day, mm. and it's something you're never quite shaken. And it's your it's one of those things you don't want to get comfortable in an area like that. That's normal. So if, if you get too comfortable, you need to, you need to leave the job. Right, right. But, so I, so I'm sitting here and uh, I'm looking at this camera. And I see, uh, it's really odd. It was almost like a wobble. Like, have you ever seen like heat coming off the ground? Exactly. Like, off the asphalt. Yeah. But it wasn't from the ground. It wasn't near a vent. It started out as a wobble, a slightly semicircular wobble, almost like a, almost like a bubble, like a soap bubble. Well, it would start coming in, and as it come in, it started illuminating. Okay, this is the middle of the day. All the people are out on the yard. Uh, there's no windows on that side of the cell house. There's, you know, uh, I had the officer walk down there after I spoke to, after I saw this. It came up probably with about three feet of the overhead camera, which is at the top of the uh, cell walk. It kind of did like a half little lock to the left to the right and zoomed, like zoomed off camera. There yeah. was nothing. There was nobody around it. There was not a thing around it. So I went, okay, this isn't, that's weird. Okay, somebody's clowning. So I knew the other officer was at the desk. So I said, look, do me a favor. Take a walk down here. Just make sure. First thing I thought, well, maybe it's smoke. Maybe somebody left something on. Maybe they left a hot pot on because a lot of times they would cook on hot pots in there. And, uh, Sorry, it's just, it's, it's weird kind of recounting it. And so he does his little walk, and I radio him and say, stop about there, look around. Do you see anything? Is anything on? No. And we had different channels for different cell houses. I said, okay, come on back. And he went over and sat down. And I went back like this, okay, nothing, not a thing, right? Okay. And he said, what? I said, nothing. He says, no, you got that, you have a, I've never seen your, you look like that, what? I said, you're going to think I'm crazy. I said, I guarantee I won't. So I told him why, and I said, and he said, yeah, that sounds about right. And understand, I'd only been working at the cell house for maybe a few weeks. And I said, uh, does this happen often? Right. Said, yeah, what you got to understand is that that walk used to be, before the new cell house that housed death row inmates, that used to be death row. And I went, oh, so... If, if that did that have anything to do with it, maybe, maybe not. Um, but I mean, there's various things like that. You would, uh, if you worked in a wall tower, uh, which basically is fenced in just two or three different levels of fences and you block yourself and, uh, you have a 360 eye view, you know, about 35, 40 feet up in the air. Right. Big stone type of stands. And you would hear tonk, 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 like that kind of slap, that like stepping on sheet metal sound and it echo and it was the thing was it was just like a tum tum it was an echoey because it, anything in the side of the wall stand on those stairs echoes and you hear that and you hear the door shake like that those big metal doors which i was armed you know and first i kind of look outside i don't see anybody okay and it wouldn't happen for a while and this i said this is when i was working midnight show yeah and 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 in a situation like that, first off, you know where all the other guards are at. Uh, there's right. not there's not many guards anyway, and and you know oh, midnight shift. It's always right, skeleton. right, exactly. You know you're alone. It's a it's a prison, so there's nobody right. out there. Wow, that's pretty. And if they are, they're, up, they're not up to any good. Yeah, right, right, you know? exactly, exactly. Um, that's that's pretty creepy, and it it would happen. Well, it sounds like the other guard wasn't even. You didn't even phase him. I mean, he it well, was some, something that he had seen and had known about for a long time. Well, you have seen, I'm sure, in the years, because I understand I first got turned on to art 
at the minimum security prison when I was working out of uh, Wallstand, and they had radios there. Right. And so I'd listen to him talking to all this crazy stuff, like the, like the, uh, the time tra- traveler tour. And you're talking about all the different, you know, uh, uh, millennium stuff. And then of course you need to have all the EVPs. Right. And that just was the scariest thing. Right. But so <laughs> I would hear something and then I would swear to God, I'm like, okay, it's nothing. And I go, because I try to be a logical person and, and you go, well, look, don't bother me. I won't bother you. Okay. Mm-hmm. Whatever, whoever it is, it's funny, okay. And then you hear somebody come up, and it sounded like they're because the sound changes. You're down in the lower part; it's deeper. The higher you get to the top, there's a little flat piece of sheet metal, and it goes tack. Right. Well, I was standing there, uh, actually cleaning my cleaning my weapon because you have to clean a weapon every uh, every shift. I heard that tap. I just instinctually spun around with a with a, with a hammer cock because I didn't know what who in heck it was. Right, right. So I looked down. I actually walked all the way down to the bottom of the wall stand, which you're not really supposed to. But I walked all the way down and checked the door. There wasn't a saw. Um, that was weird. But the thing that you will find, officers, be it you know in prisons, be it you know police officers, be it whatever various type of security. Once they know you, and some guys just won't talk about it. Um. Because I, I called a guy in another wall and said, hey, did you hear any – did you – what? No, no, no. Tell me about when the sun comes up. I was like, no, no, no. I said, no, really. Just tell me when the sun comes up. And I was like, okay. So I called him like a few hours later and he said, okay, now you can tell me. He said, I don't want you to tell me nothing. I know but I know that wall stand. I didn't want to hear about it. I'd be calling out a window. <laughs> but um, but the, the, probably the weirdest thing I saw, and I, I know time is short, I was working in an uh, area called Five So House. And uh, I would have to go every hour and make a body count just to make sure those guys are there. And I would walk past the shower. And I always got this weird feeling about the shower. And uh, it's closed after I was locked up. Do your little thing and do my count. And I always kind of pause on there's like an A and B walk, and a C and D, and then an E. And the C and D walk, it always just had this weird feeling. And so anyway... I'm doing this stuff and it's the last count of the morning and everyone's out and I'm doing, making sure everybody's out for this stuff and I'm down at the end of the wall and I have pretty good peripheral vision and I'm starting to turn and I see what at first I thought was a shadow on the floor or on the back wall uh, at, at the end of the hall, but it was a shadow shot from the hall or from the first cell into the shower. Mm. And I went, okay, long night, whatever, you know, and so I spoke to somebody and I said, anything really weird happened on this wall? He said, well, you know, you have people getting fights. It's not something serious. I said, well, there was a guy got, a guy got jumped, right and killed in, in CMB shower. And I'm like, yeah, that's wonderful. So I got to think about that all day. And uh, I had to come in the next night to the same floor. So that was great. But um, it actually got me interested in, you know, doing a little bit of my own paranormal research. And I've always had an interest in it. Which is really odd because we've talked about music, you know, I, I play in bands and right and stuff, and, and then obviously, you know, me and my wife we do our, our advocacy for special needs children and special Olympics and, and things like that. Oh, oh, oh by so the way, I want to I want to totally one hundred percent absolutely absolutely from the heart commend you on everything that you do with uh, all of uh, um, your extended family. That's absolutely incredible, and nobody knows what oh, I'm talking about right now, but you do. And, uh, and you know, you know, I, I like every photo that you post. <laughs> and, I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm, I'm really bad at taking compliments. I appreciate it. It's just, they're just, they're such great kids. Yeah. What, what you do, they, they make it easy. You're, you know? you're, you're a hero, man. And, and I really mean that. Oh, God, I hate it. Hey, hey, no, Steve, man, like I, said, I appreciate it. Thank you for calling in. Yeah. And, uh, next, uh, next Thursday, um, you've got to call in. And also th- I want to send this out. Any prison guards out there that are listening to the show right now, love to hear from you because I know you've all got stories just like Steve's. There isn't a creepier okay, place. Yeah. There is not a creepier place than a prison. Not, not, not many. The only place that was creepier. Now, if you want, if you do want me to call back next Thursday, I will. I got a story to tell you about the electric chair room. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh it, you, it, it, it is, God, it is scared it. <laughs> save save but, it for uh, next week. Man, God bless you. I love your show. Uh, like I said, you're a lot of times I'm up with my youngest, my youngest little son, Ivan, and, uh, your show is what we listen to, man. That's what we, that's what we 
big, and then that's, uh, you know, I really appreciate, appreciate you doing the format that you do, and uh, like I said, I hope to hear you guys on here for a long time. All, all the best, and give my best to your wife and and the family. Right, man. <laughs> okay, right. man. God bless. I'll talk to you, Steve. Bye Thanks, man. Bye. Bye. Yeah, Steve uh, has got a whole family of special needs children that he takes care of every single day. And uh, he's a hero. True hero. Oh, that's creepy. Prisons are creepy. Prisons are creepy. Any any prison guards out there listening right now, if you know somebody too as well that's a guard, they've all got stories. And I would love to to hear from them. I would absolutely love to. So that's what tonight's show is all about. The scariest place you have ever been. The scariest. Doesn't even have to have a ghost involved, does it? No. He was just saying, um, I've got so much email to get to tonight. And so uh, I I will try to squeeze it all in, uh, in between. And I just got to after last week, I don't know how we're going to top it, but uh, I just got an email right now from uh, another Ouija board story. I haven't read it yet, but I will get to that at some point tonight, too, as well. Um, yeah, in a few minutes, we will have Bob Rutherford on with us. Bass player, legend, plays for the band. That's a legend, actually. Well, I guess that, that qualifies him. Plays for the Dallas Moore Band. And certainly uh, a a band that has been doing it for a long, long time. And Bob Rutherford's going to be with us at the bottom of an hour. Old friend of mine. And uh, we try to get Dallas on the show tonight, too. But uh, Dallas is up in Cincinnati. You would think Dallas is in Dallas. Dallas is up in Cincinnati in the studio tonight, finishing up some tracks that they have to have finished for the record company. So uh, couldn't get Dallas tonight. But uh, nonetheless, my old friend Bob Rutherford will be joining us in just a few minutes. And uh, you know what? I'll I'll get to one email really quick. Here we go. This is from Deborah Cox. She says, I listened to part of Thursday's episode, and you read the email about the sun causing the noise. I tweeted to Lynn the same thing. It was the sun. I had been checking SDO and the K-index charge on NOAA for for the sun, often for a long time, there were several flares, even though they were C-class flares, they combined and the solar wind from them com- combined and became stronger. For six to seven straight days, the earth was experiencing geomagnetic storms. It has calmed down in the last couple of days. There were some power outages, thankfully small. A sunspot that did fire an X flare and a CME on the far side has just rounded the sun and is now facing us. If it should fire off again, it will likely hit us. It may not be anything super bad, but it could be depending on the strength. And let's see here. And that that's, we knew something was going on. And, uh, and I actually heard it uh, in the studio uh, before the show a couple of days ago, uh, off air. I got this email from Don. Uh, he says, boomerang UFOs. And then I had seen this this article uh, over the last 24 hours. A vet says boomerang UFOs had the clearest lights ever seen. That's the headline. This came from uh, Open Minds. Our friends over at Open Minds. A South Carolina witness at Cowpens reported watching two boomerang-shaped UFOs with, and I quote here, the clearest lights ever seen, according to testimony in case file 59566 from the Mutual UFO Network Witness Reporting Database. The Vietnam vet says that he has never seen aircraft like this before. It was shaped like a boomerang, he says. It had a four-foot by eight-foot lights inside and outside of each angle. He goes on to say, clearest lights I've ever seen, one nose light, nothing flashing, maybe 50 miles per hour or less, eight to 10 lights on each slope. There was two of them, and they were about 1,000 feet apart. He couldn't identify what it was, but he said it was not a blimp. It had wingspans of 100 feet by 100 feet at the end of each triangle. Pretty interesting report. 
And uh, so I, I followed up on it. It is, it is all over the Internet. Uh, interesting, uh, interesting sighting, to say the least. And do you guys remember in Texas, this was in Texas, by the way, um, the, uh, what was it called? The Slade, what was that called? The Slade, Texas sighting in 2012. Remember in the oil fields when those lights came down and landed in the fields? You guys remember that? I do. And Texas has their share of sightings. I don't know what's going on in Texas, but they like their UFOs. (laughs) UFOs love Texas. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's because it's so big and they can, you know, clandestinely just move around. This is Fade to Black. It is Fader Night, everybody. I wanted to do some more Genius or Luckiest Man Alive. How about Ryan Seacrest? Genius or Luckiest Man Alive? Carrot Top. He owns Las Vegas right now. Genius or Luckiest Man Alive. This is Fade to Black. It is Fader Night, taking your calls all night. When I come back, Bobby Rutherford right here. Stay with us. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black, on the Dark Matter Radio Network. What's up, revolutionaries? It's me, Jimmy Church. Do you have an IRS or state tax issue? Well, I did, and I called national tax experts. My problems were fixed, done, fini, and man, I got to tell you, it was a relief. National tax experts are a recognized tax office that services clients in all 50 states. It doesn't matter where you live. Give them a call. I'm telling you, they take the time to understand each and every client's individual financial status as well as their financial goals. And that's exactly what you need, my brother, when you're taking on the evil three-letter. So, seriously, give them a call today at 1-877-909-5444. Again, 1-877-909-5444. Or go check out their website, www nattaxexperts.com that's n-a-t-t-a-x e-x-p-e-r-t-s dot com tell them Jimmy sent you this is KJCR at jimmychurchradio.com on the Dark Matter Radio Network All right, welcome back. Fade to Black, the spoke radio for the masses. Tonight is Fader Night. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We are only on the Dark Matter Radio Network all around the world, across this great country of ours. Call in number is 323-825-5045. You can also Skype in Fade to Black 14. Fade to Black 14, no spaces, and the number 14. Fade to Black 14. Shoot me an email to jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. You know what to do. You can go over to the website. Have you seen the new Dark Matter website? That's pretty cool, isn't it? It's pretty cool. Kind of dig it. Saw it for the first time today, actually. Um, I'm digging it. Well, you know, I was just talking earlier, my old friend Bob Rutherford, and Bob and I were uh, uh, talking earlier today, and we figured it out. We did the math. Two guys with no brains. We've known each other for over 15 years, and uh, and I'm just I'm just humbled to have Bob with us tonight, bass player for Dallas Moore, Dallas Moore Band, and I'm just right gonna on, say, I'm just gonna say welcome to the show, Bob. How are you? Hey, thanks for having me, man. I'm, I've been really really stoked to talk to you. And so I think you you were correct. We talked about we've known each other 15 years. So we met when I was what about seven years old, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I was six. Yeah. <laughs> let's make that perfectly clear yeah it's, no you know it's been a long time we've known each other we've been friends for such a long time and we um uh in talking today this is the thing we just uh uh oh uh that's my honorary uh somebody one of the one of our uh, uh, uh people here at the show his name is space boy he's a songwriter out of texas he the he uh wrote the intro to our show and um cool. uh, and he 
uh, he sent me a certificate. I am officially, I'm officially a citizen of Texas. <laughs> we, oh, you gotta like that, man. Yeah, you gotta love that. And uh, but anyway, so we were talking er- earlier today, and the, um, the Dallas Moore Band has been doing it for a long, long time. You guys and I've, I've been watching and 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 keeping my eye on you guys for a long time. And you guys are you guys are starting to taste some real success and and starting to feel it. It hasn't always been that way. <laughs> it hasn't. But but how no, do, yeah, we but how we, does it we've just always been too stupid to quit, man, you know. <laughs> well, you know, at one point did you guys you're probably going to say we haven't yet, but what at what point did you guys get over the hump? You know, I don't know. I, I think that that my definition of success has changed so much over the years. You know, when I, when I was a kid, and, and I'm sure you were this way too. You know, I wanted to be a, a a rock star, and then you get on later in your career, and you go, you know, you get around a few stars, and you go, I don't know if I really want that. You know, I want to be able to go to McDonald's with my kids, and and you know what I mean, and do that kind of thing. But you still, you know, to me, I still want to make good records, and I want to play good shows, and I want to travel, and entertain people and 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 have as many people as possible listen to the music so i don't know to answer your question i don't know at what point that we really got over a hump so much as it started being a little easier you know what i mean <laughs> gradually it got it got easier to put dates together and all of a sudden you start doing shows in places you've never played before and people are singing the lyrics to the songs when you look out you know and, right 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 and uh, so I got that, that. That was that made a big difference for me. You know, when we started seeing different crowds. Like we started playing shows, and and you'd have a you know a lot of college kids in the crowd. You know. Yeah, and, yeah. And that was something we really hadn't had before. You know. I'm gonna, I'm going to embarrass you for a second. I have to tell the uh, Nashville story, or at least the short oh, version of it. Um, uh, Bob and I, uh, I was out in 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 uh, at the Nam show in in Nashville. This is probably 1999 or so. And uh, so I'm out there, and we plan to rendezvous at at you know and hang out, and that was our thing. And you know I'm coming to Nashville, and you wanted to make sure that you were going to be in Nashville when I was in Nashville, and so forth. So we hook up, um, in the convention center, and you go, hey man, let's go out to the bus. And I said, what? Come on, man, I got something for you out in the bus. I'm like, all right. <laughs> I don't know what that's always loaded. Yeah, isn't that it? is a. I don't know <laughs> I what I'm walking into. So, <laughs> and and so, I think you got on a phone or something. You got on your cell phone. Okay, man, we're you know, and then, so we're we're outside of the and this tour bus rolls around the corner, pulls up. We jump on the the, the Dallas Moore tour bus, which is pretty cool, man. You know, and but at the convention center, we jump on the bus. And you whipped out. What was it that we drank? We had a couple of shots, and what was it? It was shine. It was shine. What I recall, it? yeah, yeah, it was it, shine. It man. was it was shine, and I had never had it before, and uh, or at least not certainly, <laughs> not that I can remember. And, well, and we get we get good moonshine. We know all the proper hillbillies, you know. So, <laughs> so you know, and and you know now all the rage is they they come up with you know you'll go somewhere and somebody will be like, hey man, I've got some blueberry moonshine or some apple pie, and we're always like, man, you got any moonshine flavored moonshine? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I did. You know? Oh man! But that was some particularly good shine. It was, it was, and I remember uh, we we get out back off the bus, and I just remember walking in t- back to the convention center trying to be Mr. Professional. I'm in a suit, you know, and, uh, and I just remember going, man, holy crap. And, and yeah, that so, stuff will make you pee around corners, yeah. man. <laughs> and it's, it's just something I've never forgotten. And, uh, your hospitality and everything else, it's just Dallas Moore and you and everybody. It's, it's been great. And, uh, so anyway, welcome to the show. And, uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And what I would like to do, I'm just going to remind uh, our producers here who aren't sitting in the studio with me right now to uh, pop up the pictures on Twitter um, if they didn't roll past me already. We do so many tweets in a night that I can't keep up with it, and I might have missed it. No, we haven't posted it yet. Post the pictures of uh, of of Bob and, and Dallas Moore and, and, and their link, uh, to the Dallas Moore, uh, dot com page. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> you have played 
what is known as the scariest place in America, the most haunted place in America. And it happens to be a club, which is Bob Mackey's. And, yeah, yeah, Bob Mackey's in, in Wilder, Kentucky, which uh, to, to zero it in for people, it is just just southeast of Cincinnati. It's literally you can see the skyline of Cincinnati from Bobby's parking lot. And when did he yeah. he bought the club already ha- haunted, didn't he? Well, the the joint has been there, as I understand. The building in one form or another has been there since, I think, the turn of the century. Right, you know? right, right, and, right. And uh, I'm not terribly well-versed in the history of the place, but I know that it was, I think, a slaughterhouse at one play, at one time and it had been everything from a bordello to, you know, it just has a really colorful history. Take the hauntings away, you know what I mean? It's <laughs> yeah, got yeah, a, yeah, a yeah. bright history, you know. And uh, I think there's a record of a, of a few... Uh, murders there, alleged murders there, and things. But it, but it, ha- it, 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 it the, the coolest thing about it, it's 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 a destination. You should come up and 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 go with us sometime, man. It's a it's one of the true uh, the last remaining true honky tonks left in the country. You know, I mean, and by that I mean the place smells like beer and Lysol, and and the floors are not level and. You know, it, it's just a great joint, you know? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> there aren't right. many of those left, you know? Um, the first time you played there, the first time, obviously, the chatter is going around the bus. You know, okay, this is a, this place is haunted. Uh, people have died there. It's got the entrance to hell. You know, it. I, those stories are going around the bus. Were you totally freaked out before you even got to Bobby Mackey's? Well, you know, I, I don't know that I was freaked out. I was certainly curious, you know, and Dallas and I were like, well, we got to, you know, I think Dallas had been in the place before. Um, I'm a little history. I'm from the Louisville, Kentucky area, which is a little south of Cincinnati. So I'm not really a homeboy up there. We base out of Cincinnati, Ohio. So uh, those guys had, had, had been there. I hadn't, you know, but I was, man, you know, I'm up for anything. I'm like, okay, cool. I, I, uh, I I'm all, I, I'm about experience, whatever in life, you know, there's, there's, it, it, nothing surprises me at this point in my career. Right, I mean? right. So, um, but go, going in the place, and, and I know they, they've got a really cool dressing room, and the first thing you see when you walk in the dressing room is a safe. That, and actually, next time we do the gig, I'll take a picture of this safe, and, and, and I'll tweet it to you. It's this old safe from like the late 1800s that's the size of a Volkswagen. And uh, it was one of those situations where they built the dressing room around the safe because they couldn't move it, you know. <laughs> and you know, and, and you go in and you see history like that, and, and <laughs> pictures of Bobby and George Jones and everything. And they have a little, uh, sort of like a, a a museum there that's that you can go through off to the side that kind of tells the history of the place and uh, the gruesome things that have happened there and have been associated with uh, the place. I think it, at one point there was a, a guy that actually uh, brought a lawsuit against Bobby because he claimed that. Uh, a ghost had accosted him in the men's room. And uh, I, I don't know the outcome of that, but I'd, I'd have to Google that and see what the outcome of that was. But I'd have loved to have attended court and, <laughs> and heard that, you know, right, that right. tried because I'm sure that would have been interesting. But um, you'll have to have uh, Bobby on the show sometime, man. I mean, he's, you know, he's, he's been there forever. He still plays the place all the time. Bobby's band is outstanding band. And, uh, uh, I think I actually have to believe Bobby just came out with a new, a new album and, um, uh, you know, he's a great entertainer. It's just a real cool place. You know, if anybody's ever to Cincinnati area, you should check it out. It's just a, a memorable place to be, but they, they do a tour, uh, where they take you down into the, the catacombs for lack of a better word under the building. And, and they show you the rooms that used to be, uh, you know, rooms for the working girls when, when it was a, a bordello and places that were there when it was a slaughterhouse and, you know, and all that kind of thing. And it, it's, it's certainly a, a, a pretty spooky experience, you know, when now down in the basement, they have the, I think they call it the portal to hell. And, and I know you've been there and I know you've seen it. What is it? What does it look like when it, when you, I mean, well, it's like the entrance to a well, and I think at one point it may have been a water supply. Uh, now, th- now you have to, you also have to understand with Bobby's, it, it is literally right on the Ohio River. Um, 
And for those that have never been in the Ohio Valley or seen the Ohio River that comes, you know, through Cincinnati and through Louisville, it, it's uh, every bit the size of the Mississippi at most points. And it's a, it's a pretty imposing river. It is and big. And this place sits literally right on the bank of the Ohio River, you know. And uh, so I don't know what the water situation was, but I think it was a freshwater supply probably for when the place was a, uh, a meat packing house or, a, you know, a, 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 some sort of a, of a stock uh, facility there, you know, but it's a big concrete lid on a hole. <laughs> you know, so when you're on the tour and, and you've had a couple of drinks, it's like, well, you know, it's kind of freaky. I don't know if I want to be too close. <laughs> Did you hear anything weird? Yeah, there's weird things going on that are, that are, that are also punctuated by your, now bear in mind, you're underneath a huge honky tonk with, you know, a thousand hillbillies upstairs uh, dancing and drinking, and, and they've got a chute where they're throwing whiskey bottles as they empty down a chute into a big uh, sort of a dumpster that's in the basement. So every 20 seconds or so, uh, you know, a wild turkey bottle comes flying down and shatters in this thing, and it's really pretty nerve-wracking when you're on this tour in a dark basement with a, a tour guide with a flashlight, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think the rumors are over the years, like, you know, bodies have been thrown down there. You know, I mean, it's well, just crazy. Uh, the stories are nuts. Yeah, and you know, and, and, and you you hear so many things, and you know, we have things, you know, in Louisville, like the the place that I tweeted about uh, over in downtown Louisville, and and of course Waverly Sanatoriums here. You know, oh, have um, you been to Waverly? Have you been to Waverly? Yeah, it's pretty. Yeah, it's pretty freaky. Now, okay, now forget about Bob Mackey's place. I mean, <laughs> Waverly, Waverly, certainly. It, it well, it has to be haunted. I mean, it ha you look at it oh, yeah. and it, it it just looks like the the nastiest dream you've ever had. Um, and it does. It it, it literally it, it. There's no way to go up the road approaching Waverly and not have full on creeps. It just <laughs> you know, it's just a creepy joint. And, and you know this. You know, Jimmy. The sad thing about that place to me is it is it you know, has to be haunted. So many. Poor souls died there. Right, right. But it was built with the best of intentions. It was built, for people that don't know, as a as a tuberculosis hospital um, back, I believe, in the Victorian era, maybe at the turn of the century, you know. Um, and, you know, that's back in the days when tuberculosis was rampant. They didn't know how to cure it. They didn't know what to do. They would remove ribs. You know, there was, I think, at one point, one side of the building was built with big shades that could come up so people could be out on uh, literally inside, but get fresh air in the winter time because they thought that the cold air might cure, you know, TB and, and they, they were just, you know, throwing darts, you know, right, they were doing right, what right. they could for, uh, to help people with a horrible disease. And, you know, you, if you've ever read about the place, you know, about the infamous tunnel, which is a, a, a long tunnel that I don't know, I guess, uh, I, I didn't go down it. it it's a little beyond the realm of what I'm, uh, capable of doing, but it's where they would, they would roll the, the corpses down, you know, into a morgue area, you know, and, and it's the, it's the most horrible thing in the world. But at the end of the day, they built it so that other patients didn't have to see, you know, people that had expired roll by them. You know? So it, it's sad when you think about something that was built to try to be delicate with a bad situation has turned into something that's really heinous. You know? <laughs> right, 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 right. And what, can you get into Waverly? Is it totally locked down or? Well, no, no, no. Now they, I mean, they, they do tours coming and going and you have to watch the website. Uh, uh, a couple has bought it now that has actually done some work on it. And their plans last I heard were to turn it into a bed and breakfast type situation where it was actually a hotel that you could go stay on the first few floors of and I'm sure take haunted tours and that type of thing and, you know, uh, uh, dine there and, and then spend a weekend with your spouse if you wanted to. And I think that's their intention. The place is so massive, I can't imagine the financial expenditure that you're talking about to do that. You know what I mean? So I'm sure. And I think I think these folks took the place over with the greatest of intentions and – uh uh, a, a, a bent toward trying to be true to the place. So, you know, anytime that happens, you know, you're, you're looking at a long time to try to get it uh, functional. I hope that, uh, I hope that it's someplace that uh, you can fly in and go, uh, you know, stay the night and just spend a weekend and have a great spooky time. 
Um, it's not that at the moment, but I think they do at certain times a year do tours and certainly around Halloween. They, 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 I think we're doing them last year anyway. Were you ever able to get in there, you know, as a kid before, uh, it was bought? Yeah. I, well, I, I went up there when, you know, when doors were off the hinges and it was a place to go, um, with a six pack of beer. And that's what I'm talking about. Who, that's, that's, yeah, what, that's exactly. what I'm and and t- tell me about it. I mean, I th- I have seen lots of video. I've seen lots of investigations on Waverly, and out of all of those types of places across the United States, the sanitarium, you know, the the orphanages, the prisons, and so forth. Waverly, Waverly's probably top two, if not, top, you know, if not the top place. But you have been there. And to go there without a tour, to go to go up there with a six pack and your buddies at night, that's the story I want to hear. And I got, <laughs> I know you was scared. Well, you know, we would we would go play play shows over in the south in Louisville, you know, and you'd be, you know, you'd have a a, a, a party and a good time, and then be like, ah, let's go to Waverly, you know. And and uh, I, I tell you what, of, of the spooky places that I've been in my life, and there've been several. Um, that's one of the few places where you actually, I actually get to, you get to a point where you're like, no, man, I'm not going any further. <laughs> I'm just not going to do it. You know? Right. right. And uh, I'm a pretty adventurous spirit, but there's also a point where, um, and you know, I know you've been around this stuff, obviously, you, you know, hosting the show, you've been around all kinds of stuff like this. There's a point where you're like, okay, I'm just pushing the envelope here. You know, is, is there's no good going to come. At this. <laughs> <laughs> and Waverly's one of those things to me. Now, um, I've never been on a guided tour there and it might be different. Uh, if you have a little more, a little bit more historical, um, outlook to it and, and a little bit uh, more guidance. But, um, I know it's a very, very frightening place. It's a frightening place to drive up and look at, you know, and you and um, you can pull pictures up on the net, and it just scares the hell out. Oh of yeah, you. yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that that that's it. Waverly is it, man. Any yeah. uh, any and any... it's up on a big hillside. I mean, you can see it in the distance. You know, from the south into Louisville. Um, you know, you can you can see the place. There's no mistake in what it is. It is certainly the the creepy joint up on the hill. You know. <laughs> now you tweeted me today, or you tweeted to everybody actually um, about uh, the music complex. Yeah. Okay, t- tell me uh, about that. Going back 19 years, when I first met Dallas, um, Dallas's manager uh, brought me in to produce Dallas's first album. And uh, long story short, I was working with, I'd come off the road for a while from touring and was working with Dallas's manager and, and kind of learning the business end of the music business a little more. We had a management company, an agency in Louisville where we were booking national acts and middling national acts. We at one point managed Robbie Knievel, the motorcycle stunt man, Evil Knievel's son and some things like that. And, and, uh, we were, how we had a, there was a uh, group of guys that owned the company and they owned a, a series of nightclubs called coyotes, uh, that they had at one point, I think four or five in the chain in, you know, the, the, the South and Southeast here. And, uh, one was set at a place called O'Malley's corner, which is the corner of fourth street and, uh, or, you know, second street and Liberty in Louisville, Kentucky. And it was essentially, several big music venues housed within one huge building. And it was pretty much a city block, you know, under roof, uh, that had been just a multitude of things over the years, as you can imagine, you know, as these buildings sort of merged one into another. And, uh, this, I think some of the bigger, uh, the, uh, ghost shows had done some things at this place. And, uh, you know, the DJ booth had been a projection booth, uh, when one part of the building was a, uh, uh, a, an old theater. And, uh, I know the DJ at the time you would go up and you would have to kind of duck and go up these little, little funky staircase, you know, and get up with a guy and you could overlook the, the big venue, which was a uh, roughly 12, 1400 seat room. And, uh, he would always talk about, there was a, some sort of entity that would be in the booth with him and he could never see it if he looked at it, but his peripheral vision, he could see it plainly, but if he would turn and try to look at it, it would, not be there and uh he would talk about it uh stomping until he lived this back when you could smoke in in clubs you know mm-hmm. he said it would stomp until he lit a cigarette and he would literally light cigarettes and keep it burning so he figured it must have been you know the spirit of an old smoker you know that and he, he used to leave cigarettes uh every night he'd leave a couple cigarettes uh laying on a turntable and i always got a kick out of that uh <laughs> which would of course be gone the next day you know 
Right, that's the story. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah, It's really yeah. a spooky place. They had a, a, one corner of the place was a uh, dueling piano bar. It was a great entertainment concept back in the 90s, you know, and and uh, there was a, 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 I always heard everybody talk about a little girl that would walk through Um in roughly from the description, I would guess, you know, antebellum era, Civil War era attire from what people describe, you know. Uh -huh. And I never saw her, but I did. We would have to come down the steps from our offices. Our offices were up on a up on the, the second story of this place. And we would come down the steps to use a restroom, and I, I would walk down the steps and out into this club, which, of course, you know, in the middle of the afternoon, there's nobody there. It's this huge place, you know. And I, I would hear her whistling. And I'd always be like, you know, it'd sound like a child whistling. And I remember going back upstairs and going, who's down there whistling? Because none of the maintenance guys are in there. What's going on? And be, oh, man, that's the little girl. <laughs> you know? Oh, no. And Yeah, I think the, the history of that was uh, at one time there had been a row of houses there. And uh, a little girl had been, there had been a buggy accident where a, a horse had gone loose or something and run up in a yard and, and killed a child that, where the front yard would have been at a, that exact point, you know? And, uh, so there were really how, things went yeah, on. How there. does that make you feel when you hear, you know, you, you know, you've heard the, you know, you heard the whistles yourself. Okay. And then you can either, it's your imagination or maybe it's somebody whistling around the corner or something, but then you hear that part. Do you, does your stomach just like freak out? Do you just like, Holy crap. Well, you know, in, in that place, it, it was always kind of, I was there every day. Um, I was there when I was promoting the shows there at night. I was in the place all the time. So you would hear stuff and you would see stuff. And uh, knowing, of course, a, a place like that has hundreds of employees. Nobody had ever had anything bad happen to them. So it became more about, it was kind of an interesting story. And and you, you knew the humanity behind it. You knew that you're talking about a child that was killed in an accident, if that's indeed what it was. So, you know, that never, I, I was never really scared there, uh, except a couple of times I did leave there at night when I was the last one in the building and you would have to set the security code and then really just sprint to the back exit door of a, of a huge venue. You know, you know what I'm talking about? A big room that's a 12, 1400 seat room. You and just, you know, that you just remind in the dark. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you know, just reminded me. Have you guys ever played the Omni New Daisy on Beale Street? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in Memphis. Yeah, in Memphis. Now, I, I, I was, uh, we were talking about R.T. Scott and the Delta Rebels earlier. Um, yeah. I, I was, there was a guy that ran that club. Uh, his name was Mike Green. You probably remember that guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, it, it uh, I was the... I was the production manager guy, but I was, uh, you know, I and ran monitors. Sometimes I ran sound, but basically I got the bands off and on, uh, on the stage and I would announce, you know, introduce every act, you know, are you ready to rock? You know, I'd be that dude. So, um, but anyway, I was the last guy out of there at night, every single night, you know, get all the mics put away, get the, you know, the PA packed up, lights down, all that stuff. And at the Omni New Daisy, like one night a week that we would do boxing, you know, it wasn't music every single night. And uh, right. so anyway, I'd be the last guy out and that place was huge. And I don't know how old it was. It used to be a movie theater too. Like a yeah, lot, that's a, that was an old theater. That yeah. was probably a 2000 seat room. Yeah. That's yeah. A room. Huge room. That was a big room, big room. And, um, so anyway, at night there, I was never alone. Never, I was yeah. never alone. There was always noise going on. That had a big backstage yeah. area with uh with it had a scene, street scene of Beale Street and and so forth. So it had all these like catacombs in the back where they would move sets in and out. People in Memphis that are listening to this right now know exactly what I'm talking about when it when it comes Beale Street itself is just old. I mean Beale Beale Street yeah. is old. And uh anyway, I was never alone. There was always noise going on in there. I can't tell. I, 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 it was like every single night. I, I don't know how many times I said, Hey, anybody here? Anybody here? You know, it's, what's going on? Yeah. You know, and, and I would be alone. You know, I would, my car would be parked out back when I left at night. I was the only guy on Beale street sometimes. And there was, right. yeah, creepy, uh, creepy, creepy situation when you're like that. And, uh, and well, you know, this place, 
this place down on Fourth Street in in uh, Louisville with several uh, clubs, and it was literally almost a city, entire city block. And the, of course, the, you know, you, you can imagine the muscle they have at a place like that because they're running, you know, ten thousand people a night through all these clubs. Sure. And uh, at night they would have to go search the place because they had had trouble before. I was there where people would hide. You know, they would hide when when they would close the joint and some place that big. You can find a little a little stairwell, something to hide under, you know, and then they'd lock the place up and somebody would rip off booze or whatever, you know. That's exactly what I'm these talking guys about. Would go yeah. On these, right. Yeah. These guys would go on these big searches every night. And I remember one night being in there after we'd had a, a nat, well, I know what it was. It was George Thorogood that played that night. And uh, I was talking to the manager and it was a, uh, just, a, you know what, you can imagine the cash that goes through a place like that. Uh, and the guy literally had to make a drop and had a ton of cash piled up and, of course, a lot of the guys were armed and, and because, you know, just a, that's a really a lot of cash to have in one spot, you know, at, at 3 a.m. And um, I remember the manager, they'd done all their checks and the manager looked up and in the distance back in the backstage area, he's like, hey, get that guy. We all turned around and see a, a guy standing back there and everybody, you know, these big, you know, muscle bound cats all <laughs> take off to go get him. And I remember looking away and looking back and he was gone. And the guys searched the whole place and never saw anything. Wow. And one, one of the bouncers told me, he said, he was the, the, the first guy that got, that got close to him. And he said, he literally just went and was gone. <laughs> and the guy came back and was like, you know, this, this is a big bruiser of a cat, you know, like a college football playing boy, you know, maybe 22 years old. And he came back from the, the you know, I'm talking about maybe 100 yards away and walks back. He was pale, and he's like, man, I need a drink, like, right now. <laughs> you know, we were laughing. He's like, no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> I, need a, I need a drink. Uh, you know, I, you know I, so. I, I love the South. I miss the South. Oh, I wanted to t- – I, I just got to tell the story because it's hilarious. Mike Green one night at uh, the Omni New Daisy, it was boxing night, and – so I didn't have bands to introduce, but he always wanted to keep me, you know, employed kind of thing. So my job on Monday nights uh, um, at the Omni New Daisy was I was a bar back. I would serve beer. Okay. Yeah, that's hard work. Yeah, it's hard work. And so anyway, so he comes in. I'm, I'm at the bar and he puts this. He, he comes in one night and uh, he comes in and, and, and puts a brown paper bag clunk on the bar in front of me and he goes i put that on the cash register i go what's that he goes it's a gun i said what's it for (laughs) and he goes look little guy comes in here little guy with his hair greased back you know and he describes him to me you know his name's bill or whatever shoot him (laughs) (laughs) i go what shoot him just shoot him and I was like, you got to be statute of limitations is way gone on this one. So anyway, so I, yeah. I, I put the, I, 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 I did, I, I took the, I didn't even look inside and it, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a pistol and I, and I put it down underneath the bar and all night long, I'm looking for this guy that never showed up. I wasn't going to shoot anybody. I was just freaked out about the story. I don't even know yeah. if it was real, you know, if he was just messing with me. But uh, he just needed to get this pistol out of his pocket or whatever the deal was. But all night long, I'm serving beer with shaking hands. You know, I'm just shaking. I'm nervous. I'm looking <laughs> looking to my left, looking to my right for this guy with the hook nose named Bill. You know, whatever. But uh, it was just funny. Mike Green. Oh, man, I love that guy. Uh, now, uh, well, you, usually, you know, you can just hit him in the head with the pistol and it makes a pretty good impression. You know? <laughs> One of the coolest things that I did, uh, you know, introducing bands and, and everybody that came through that club, because that was the biggest club in Memphis at the time, besides like mud Island, you know, so the, you know, you either played the new Daisy or you played like mud Island or the mid South Coliseum or something. So all the big acts came through there and it was great, but I got to tell you Monday nights boxing at that place was unbelievable to sit at a, a boxing ring, you know, 10 yards in front of you, you know, 30 feet and watching these guys and the sound and everything was just, that was, uh, that was an amazing time. And for me to go through that was uh, pretty cool. Um, well, man, do you ever, um, you know, I know you're a a sports fanatic like I am, man. Did you ever uh, experience, um, uh, the ABA in basketball? Oh, of course. 
Of course, you know, in, now, in Louisville we had the Kentucky Colonels. And, you had and, the uh, we had the Pacers. Yeah, since, we had the Pacers yeah. up in Indianapolis. Yeah, I, I, right. I, yeah. And, and Cincinnati had the Royals. I think that's you know, right. That's I right. always when I was when I was a kid, I loved that stuff because you know that it was like you know a big time wrestling meets real sports. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know not to insult wrestling, mm-hmm. but, you know that mm-hmm. entertainment value. Mm-hmm. And you know, it, it, the only thing in the world you could go see a basketball game, and at halftime they'd have. Somebody wrestling a kangaroo. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Somebody spinning plates. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Those yeah, were the dancing days. bear or something. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, hey. Yeah, they did know. that up in Indianapolis um, a lot. So, oh, I, I, really quick before I let you go, there's uh, two things. One, I'm looking at the Dallas Moore uh, band promo picture. That's I want everybody to know that's uh, that's uh, Bobby in the back in the white shirt. Um, but who is, who are we looking at here? Left or right? Who is uh, standing to your right, left or right? Oh, let me pull the picture up here real quick because there are several of those. Not that I don't know who's in the band, but you know how we do a shoot and there, there are tons of photos. So I want to make sure I'm telling you the right people. Um, Oh goodness. So, uh, on the far left in the black, there's yeah. a fellow from Louisville, Kentucky here named Mike Owens, great player. A uh, harmonic player sings with us and, and plays harp. Uh, that's me next to Mike. Uh, the white shirt, Dallas, of course, in the middle in the front. Right. And uh, uh, the next fellow uh, with a white bandana on his head, that's Rocky Parnell from Cincinnati. It's our drummer, great guy, great drummer. Yeah, and then on the right is Moore Pergo, um, who is originally from the New Jersey area and now lives in Cincinnati. And uh, Dallas and Chuck and I have all been together. I brought Chuck in. When we did the first album, man, so we've all been together, I guess, nineteen years now. That's that's crazy. And how do yeah. you, you know, how do you have success? You never break up, ain't that right? <laughs> Don't quit. Don't go away, man. Don't keep you know? your. I mean, keep your foot on the gas. And exactly, uh, man. And then uh, uh, here's your promo picture. Um, is this for Schechter Bases? Yeah, that was for Schechter. That's for Schechter, yeah. and uh, there you go. Who do you work with over at Schechter? Um, I was working with a guy named Alan Steelgrave. Yeah, Alan. And, uh, uh, Alan used to be my assistant over at Ashdown. Exactly. Yeah, he worked and, for uh, me. He... I think Alan is left Schechter now. Oh, and, he has. Uh, there's a fellow named uh, Anthony Ramirez. Oh yeah, he's a good. Uh, he's a good. Ca- yeah, he's a good cat. Too. Real good guy. Yep. Yeah. yeah, I hired Alan. He was just like a little uh, salesman at a at a store here in Los Angeles somewhere and somebody recommended him to me and I hired him and he was my assistant for, uh, I call him my assistant. He sat outside of my office for five years and he yapped on the phone is what he did. But, um, a great kid. And, and I was so happy to see him go to Schechter and, and have some success over there. And, and so, yeah, Alan Steelgrave, man, good kid, good kid. Well, he's an we adult now. We gave him the now, moonshine but... treatment. We gave him the moonshine <laughs> treatment, too. So if that, if that makes you feel any better, yeah. man. I, when I hired you know, him, he had like four feet of hair. It went down, yeah. you know, and then he cut it off and, and went all business on us. But, yeah, he was a kid when I hired him, and now he's a man, and, and uh, good for him. So, uh, oh, 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 before I let you go, um, uh you said you, we were talking today and I stopped you. Uh, you said you, you had a UFO sighting when you were on tour in between Cincinnati and Kentucky or something. Yeah. I, I drive a lot cause I've, you know, got kids here at home. So I, when I, whenever I can, we, we come and go from Cincinnati, you know, how Nashville bands did that from Nashville and you always have a place you base out of, you know? And, uh, so I end up driving back from Cincinnati a lot at, uh, you know, three, four AM when, when we've gotten in or gotten done with shows or whatever and, and trying to get home to see the kids and things and and uh came home one night, this has been five years ago, and to the it would have been I mean, you know, that's I seventy one which runs from, from directly from Cincinnati to Louisville and ends in Louisville. So it would have been to the southwest. On my left, half the trip home I see a a, a light off in the distance up high altitude just dancing around. You know, uh, not stationary and, and not moving in an arc like a plane would, you know, but just dancing. And I remember pulling over at one point and going, what is this? You know, I can figure this out. You know, it's just I'm not, you know, focusing on it and literally watching it until I was bored with it. Um, it was bobbing around like, you know, now in the days where, where people have a, a laser pen and they'll play with a cat on the wall, you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it was almost doing that. And uh, literally drove along until I, I uh, got bored with it and. 
it got back in the car and came on home. You're getting tired, you know. How long? How long it was, was it there? Uh, it was there from probably. I, I can I can tell you. I've made that trip so many times. I can tell you the mileage. It was there for at least seventy miles. Wow. So I remember still seeing it when I got into Louisville. It was. I mean, it was that high in altitude. It didn't really shift position so much over the course of of seventy miles. You know, and it's. Uh, I guess it's like seventy five miles from. Uh, where I-71 splits off 75 at Cincinnati or south of Cincinnati to Louisville, Kentucky. Right. It's sad I know this that well, but um, <laughs> you know, I've driven it literally thousands of times. But um, but yeah, it was one of those things that it, uh, you know, I'm funny like that. If I don't feel threatened by something, uh, or if something's not ominous to me, it may I'm curious about it. You know right, what I mean? Right. I'm like, well, what is that? Let's figure this out. You know, I'm I'm all about poking the bear you know, until the bear stands up. <laughs> have you ever been speaking? You're, you're stirring my memory. Have you ever been, you've been to Greenville, Mississippi? Yes, I have. Yeah. Okay. That's another pretty creepy, you know, nice town. I don't want to say, but, but you know, that's where the crossroads is, you know, Robert yeah, Johnson, well, the, whole blues, the whole blues trail down there. You right. Know, all right. Juke joints and, and, the, and the crossroads, Robert Johnson story. And yeah, yeah right. that is creepy. You're, it, you're correct. Yeah. And you know, for everybody out there, that's where, uh, everybody listening, that's where Robert Johnson, the guitar player sold his soul to the devil, wrote a contract, signed it in blood as the story goes. And then overnight became the greatest guitar player. And seriously, uh, that that album uh, with the, yeah. with the missing track um, is still um, what, Hellhound on My Trail, right? Yeah, it's <laughs> it's pretty spooky, man. Hellhound on My Trail, and that's where the, the 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 famous deal with the devil was struck. Well, I when I went to Greenville, I went down to a couple of blues clubs that. Uh, like after hours juke joint blues clubs, like in a house kind of thing out. Yeah. Out in a cornfield, out yeah. in a cornfield and the yeah, real crazy. deal, real deal place, man. You know, you had a guy over in the corner that had like a bottle of moonshine, a jug underneath the table. You would go yeah, up. They don't sell booze. That's they, they don't, don't sell booze. Lights. They don't sell that's booze. Right, do right. You just show up with a bottle and <laughs> right. And some cats are playing. It's and, awesome. And and over on another table on the other side, you would go like buy uh, um, uh, cranberry juice or something, you yeah. know, in a glass, and that would cost you five bucks. And then you'd walk over yeah. to the other table. If they put like one straw in it. It's like one shot, and they put in two straws. It was just some weird, you know, yeah. It's some weird way of doing it. And then you go over to this guy and put your cup down on his table, and he'd reach down beside him, grab his jug of moonshine, and 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 put put a shot in your glass. And that's the way they did it all night long. Anyway, yeah, I was totally creeped out. I was there till like six a.m. in the morning. And uh, I did it two nights in a row. A friend of mine, Billy Keaton, lived there and, and took me there. He's a singer out of Memphis. Anyway, uh, Greenville, Mississippi, man, that is another uh, place where things like voodoo. I don't want to say. I don't want to say. I, I just want to say respect for 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 religion. It goes on in that town. They respect both sides, you know. And it's, yeah, they certainly do, man. And you get a pretty snappy respect for it when you get down there it's easy to <laughs> it's easy to go you know and to scoff and everything until you get down there and you're like well you know i think i'll keep my head down and shut up you know? <laughs> <laughs> i miss the south i miss the south i miss traveling and and uh, uh you know those days uh, you know going around the south and experiencing the south firsthand uh there's nothing like it so what have you guys got going on next where are you playing next uh, we're actually doing, believe it or not, we're doing a show in Louisville, Kentucky tomorrow night right here at home. I'm actually going to be able to go to a gig without, you know, having to drive somewhere and, and get in another vehicle and go for X miles. Cause we were, we just came back from Minneapolis and, uh, near Davenport, Iowa and La Crosse, Wisconsin and Cincinnati. In the last few days, I've had a few days off here at home, yep. uh, but tomorrow night we're in, in Louisville, Kentucky. And then, uh, uh, Saturday, we're in Cincinnati, Ohio, and then the whole trail starts again. And uh, you, you caught me off guard, Jimmy. I'm not really sure. I always have to pull it up. People <laughs> laugh at me. They're like, you know, where are you at? You know, next week. And I'm like, I don't know. I just, 
I get you on know, the bus. <laughs> dude, I married a woman much uh, smarter and 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 prettier than me, and and I come home, and if there's a suitcase sitting here, I, that means I'm going, you know, and <laughs> I just kind of keep my head down and do what I'm told. It, 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 you know, God bless everything that you guys do, man. And uh, what I want you to do, first off, uh, I know Dallas is in the studio tonight, um, and I know he knows that you're on the show with me tonight. Just tell him I said, yo, and what I would like to do next week when you guys uh, get settled in on the road, uh, we'll bring Dallas in on the show, and we'll give away some tickets on the show uh, 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 wherever you guys are going to be in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. All right? We'll certainly do it, man. All It'd right. be awesome. You got it. Bob Rutherford. Thank you, Bob. Jimmy, thanks so much. It's great talk to you, brother. It's great talking to you. Been way too long, my brother. Way too long. And you know, thanks for keeping it clean. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll talk to you. Thanks, Bob. Thanks a lot, buddy. Bye, bye. Bob Rutherford from the Dallas Moore Band. And let me tell you something. Dallas, the Dallas Moore Band is the real deal. The real deal. All about America, man, and uh, I love everything that they do. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, we uh, we go way back on the way back machine. This is Fade to Black only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Dallas, for letting Bob come on the show tonight. This is Fade to Black, Fader Night. Taking your calls three two three eight two five fifty forty five. I want to know the scariest place you've ever been. I'll be back right after this. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. matter. You're listening to Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carzanel, tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed, believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. What's up, everybody? This is Fade to Black. (laughs) <laughs> only on the dark matter radio network. Thank you, Bob Rutherford. Great to hear your voice. I got to tell you that story about Nashville and the tour bus <laughs> moonshine is no joke. And he set me up too. He totally set me up and, uh, him and his bus driver. Uh, it was pretty funny. We drove the bus around the block and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's kind of funny when they get a, you know, some innocent city boy like myself from Los Angeles out there on a tour bus. Uh, they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew I had never gone down that that dark path. Moonshine. Wow. <laughs> that stuff works. It is correct. This is Fade to Black only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Taking your calls. This is Fader Night. I want to know the scariest place that you have ever been. I've talked about a couple tonight. Man, I can't believe he's been to Waverly. That's right. You know, it's, it's right there in his hometown. I I just can't imagine. Let's, uh, let's start banging some calls. Here we go. It says fade to black. You're live with Jimmy church. Who's calling? Where are you calling from? Yeah, this is Steve from Bluefield. It's Steve. Hey man, you just had your brother on, you know, Bob Rutherford. (laughs) I was thinking man, about he you. Cool. <laughs> he is cool as the other side of the pillow, ain't he? Man, he is, man. He is. And you know what? The thing is about Bob, and and you know what? You know, you and, and, and you know, that Southern 
hospitality, that respect for everybody, that's what you get, you know, and, and you can see that in Bob and just listening to him talk, you know, that he has got respect for everybody around him, but man, he's got a sense of humor. And, and that's one of the things when I go to the South, you hang out with the right guys, you know, not the right, you hang out with the right guys and you're going to laugh all night. You know, you're, you're, you're family. Right. Yeah, Absolutely. I have got to tell you about the first experience with Shine for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all, right, all right, all right. I remember it like it was yesterday, Jimmy. <laughs> I, was, I was 13, 14. You know, we should, we drink, you know, where I'm from, Jimmy, you know, Shine, this is where Shine's made. Right. I mean, this is where good Shine is made. <laughs> right. Not the stuff that tastes like gasoline. Right. Yeah, you know, this is good shine. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, thirteen years old, and when I, when I grew up, all my friends were four or five years older than I, I was. I was the youngest one in my crowd. So when they would drink, I would drive because I was way younger than everybody. Even when I was thirteen, you know, we didn't have cops that would mess with you. You could just drive. Right. You know. Well, I'm, Those days are this, gone, this but one horse town. Yeah, we know you what know. you're talking about. So. uh well, one night, we're out, and they're like, hey, it's your turn. I'm like, what do you mean? It's my turn. You're going to light this candle tonight. And I'm like, no, no, no. I don't think I want none of that. Oh, yeah. So they talked me into it. Jimmy. I got so messed up. So messed up. We went to the mall, and I went in a store, and I tried on a pair of jeans right in the store. I didn't worry about the, <laughs> the dressing room. I stripped down right there in the store uh, and put on a pair of jeans. Uh, 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 they had, my boys had to carry uh, me out of there. We've all I was lost. We've all I was lost. Yeah. <laughs> everybody, everybody has got that story. You know, everybody, that story that you just told, Everybody's got that story. You know what I mean? And you hold it back. You don't tell it often. You know, you don't. But, you, you know, there's something about when you're young like that and you mess with something like that. Uh, it's it's a drunk that you don't ever have probably for the rest of your life. You know? And, and you know exactly. Oh, I, swore, I swore it off for years. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Happens to all of us. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't touch it after that. <laughs> oh, you, you you just said the word shine and and I got scared. Oh man, <laughs> I'm telling you that when I walked in when I walked into that convention center after I got off that bus and I only had two shots. Well, that's that, all it takes. Jim. Yeah, yeah. If I remember correctly, uh, they were double shot glasses. You know, this is a band's tour bus, so you know it's equipped, and it's the on top of that, it's the Dallas Moore Band tour bus. And, uh, have you ever seen Dallas Moore? No, never have Jim. man. You got to check him out. And, uh, if he's, if he's ever going through Bluefield, what's the next big, biggest city for you? Uh, Charleston, West Virginia, uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. They play Charlotte all the time. I'll make sure you got tickets. Okay. I'll make I'll sure. Yeah, Charlotte's close for me. That's only two hours, two yeah. and a half hours for me in Charlotte. North Man, you'll you'll never forget it. That's a good night, and you know they they play big places, so the crowds are always good. And and uh, Dallas Moore Band's a real band, you know. So I'll uh, definitely check it out. So real quick, um, real quick, the scariest place. Now, last week you had the one of the best phone calls ever. It was epic last week. But uh, well, the, the, scariest, the place, scariest you... place that I ever went and was, you know, I wasn't scared going into the the house that I told you about last week. You know, I, at the time I was 18, so I wasn't scared. The scariest place is there's a lot of cold camps around here where I live. My father one day says, hey, let's go check out this old cold camp down in Pocahontas, Virginia. Like, yeah, sure, you know, anything my old man said, you know, I'm in for it. You know. I'm I'm a tag along. I'm going. So we get there and you know, this this thing's been deserted for twenty or thirty years in old coal camp. <laughs> and it's starting to get late in the evening. It's not dark yet, but it's late in the evening. 
and we're going through these old abandoned you know uh company stores you know company houses and everything <clears throat> and I was just like, hey, I started getting scared. I was like, hey, Dad, I, I don't think this is, you know, we need to be in this stuff, you know. I I don't like this stuff. And he's like, oh, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. And I was like, no, I got I got scared. I said, well, I'm going back to the truck. You, you can check out the coal can. That's not for me. Right, right. <laughs> but that was the scariest place to it is. And those it, old coal camps is tr- is just freaky. They just freak you out. You know that old ab- abandoned stuff like that would just freak you out. It, freaks me out. I don't know about everybody else. It freaks me out. It freaks me out, and and claustrophobia, and 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 those kinds of, of minds. I would never do it. Um, it, it. They reek of death as it is. You have no idea uh, what went down before you and everything else. So. Yeah, I'm absolutely with you. Thank you, Steve. All the best. And uh, like I said, Charleston, next time they're coming through, I'll get you some tickets, brother. You'll love it. Uh, hey, was Jim Mars not on point last night? Man, Jim Mars was way on point. You know, uh, I, I got so much uh, email and and Twitter last night was saying we should just need to have a Jim Mars week. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's it, he is just such a great, uh, just a great guy. And, but, but it's the other side of him. It's his sensibility, the way that he looks at the world. You just want to just sit and listen. You just want to sit and listen. That's it. And, uh, that, that's all I did last night. You know, it was hard for me to talk because I'm listening. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, everything, I mean, every single thing that he talked about was on point. I mean, everything. He's a he, wasn't, he wasn't off base on anything. No, 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 no. And he looks at the world correctly. And like I said, I, I, I just sat and listened. It was such a treasure. You know, every time he's been on the show, when we were at Contact in the Desert, it was the same thing. He just hung out with everybody all night and, and talked and, and, and hung out. And he's like that. And he would have kept hanging out with us, too. We had to leave. I, we almost took him with us, you know, he's like that. He's just a great guy. Absolutely. Thanks for calling in, good Steve. Deal. Hey man, all, right. all, all the have best. A good, have a good one, Jim. And I'll talk to you next week. Have a good one, bud. You got it. That was Steve from Bluefield. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally with him. Coal mines. Uh-uh, I ain't doing it. Just got an email. I, I just want to read this real quick. I mentioned Gina Zamparelli earlier. Gina is known all around the world, big, big promoter. Um, her dad and I were really, 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 really close friends. And, uh, but anyway, he says, Gina used to book my band Rathbone at Perkins back in the day. My guitarist, Gary Lee went to school with her. I know Gary Lee, by the way, love the show, brother. And that is, he says, mahalo from the big Island. And I don't know if Gina's listening tonight, but Gina, you are worldwide, international, metropolitan, Gina Zamparelli. All right, let's see here really quick. I had a couple of things that I wanted to get to. Oh, oh, let's do this really quick before I bang the next call. I want to read this uh, this Ouija board story. This is what I got. Okay, she says, hello, Jimmy. I'm a wimp for not calling in. <laughs> so she wrote the story. Now, this story is not exactly scary, but it's odd. So when I was a kid, around nine years old, my friend Kathy and I used to play Ouija all the time. Sometimes we used to just sit there with our hands on the indicator and just chatted amongst ourselves while it moved around the board. One day, we were asking questions of no relevance when my friend's little sister came into the room. Of course, we yelled and kicked her out, closed the door, and continued to play. A few minutes later, the board started to spell out, Dirty Shirt. We asked why it spelt that, but it just kept on spelling, Dirty Shirt, Dirty Shirt, over and over. All of a sudden, her little sister burst into the room, and guess what? She was wearing her father's white work shirt. 
that we later found out discovered in the hamper. It was filthy. He was in construction, a woodworker, so you can imagine. Kathy and I were staring at each other in shock when the board started to spell out something again. It spelled out, told ya, and then started going, ha, 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 ha. It was moving so fast that our hands fell off of it, and it stopped. It was laughing. While I thought it was kind of cool, my friend did not. She refused to play with me again. And that, (laughs) that's from Myra. Thank you, Myra. Love Ouija board stories. Never, ever mess with a Ouija board. You just don't do it. Oh, okay. So let me get uh, through a couple of things. Joan Rivers passed away today. Uh, R.I.P. Joan. That's all you can say. Rest in peace. And uh, we we all, what was weird about it, and and I just wanted to say this um, uh, out of total respect, but we saw this coming. And even with that, with how the surgery went wrong and, and she was without oxygen, supposedly, uh, we don't know. Um, but, uh, the way that it went down and we were warned, we saw this coming. And even with that, even with all of that, I was still surprised today. I thought that, uh, we were warned. We knew it was coming, but, but, uh, I was surprised to read it. I thought she was going to pull through. And, uh, and the other thing was, uh, for me was, uh, Larry King, uh, uh, tweeted out today, and I was reading that, and I was thinking, how did Larry, how 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 did Larry outlive Joan Rivers? It wasn't supposed to happen that way, was it? Joan Rivers, eighty-one years old, rest in peace. This is Fade to Black, only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Three two three eight two five fifty forty five. Taking your calls. Where is the scariest place you've ever been? I'll be back right after this. God on JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? My name is Brian Taylor, Ninja Badass Extraordinaire, and this is JimmyChurchRadio.com. J-J-C-R in your face. JimmyChurchRadio.com on the Dark Matter Radio Network. All right. You got to love the smell of WD-40. This is Fade to Black, only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Taking your calls, 323-825-5045. My mic stand, I got one of the, you know, the, the radio spring boom stand. And, okay, it was squeaking. So during the break, I, yeah, the squeak's gone. Do you guys hear that? No. Squeak is gone. Got Michael Anderson from Naptown. How are you, Mike? Hey, Jimmy. How you doing tonight? I'm doing fantastic, my brother. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. Did you- I got a scary story or I got a political comment. What would you, what do you want to hear tonight? Oh man, scare me first and we'll do some politics. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So the scariest story, basically me and a bunch of friends, and we're probably about 23, 24. We're in the woods around stop 11 area. And, uh, this is Halloween night. And, uh, of course, you know, we got a little fire out there and we're a little bit, you know, white boy wasted. And, uh, you know, we're all acting silly and acting stupid. Right. And out in the middle of the woods, we see this white thing just kind of hover in there. Now we're all pretty creeped out because this is, you know, also around our grateful dead days. So we're just three sheets to the wind. We're just, well, when you say white thing, what, what do you mean? This, well, that's, that's where we're, that's where the story kind of goes. Well, I mean, what did it look like though? Was it, uh, was like it... a white orb that just kind of moved and stood, but stayed in the same spot and just kind of pulsated. Gotcha. And it just pulsated and pulsated. And we are all just completely freaked out. And we're a good 45 minutes in discussing what that is and who's going to go. And it basically, it took us 45 minutes after we decided to get up around the fire and go to like creep 10 feet, creep 10 feet, creep 10 feet, talk about it for another 10 minutes, smoke another cigarette, creep another 10 feet, come to find out 
it was a white trash bag stuck on a tree limb <laughs> floating in the wind. Uh, uh, that ain't right. Yeah. No, that took, ain't right. That it ain't took right. like two hours to figure that out. That ain't right. That ain't right. Oh man. Uh, what what's the scariest scariest place you've ever been? The scariest place. That's the theme tonight. Well, I've spent the night on the roof of Waverly Sanitarium. Oh no way. Yeah, yeah. A couple of us did. We went out there with with girls, and this is this is before the people that bought it bought it. But we we got up to the top, which was hard. We had to do some things we shouldn't have to get up there and, uh, you know, had wine and, and cheese and tried to make it off to be like, you know, the super cool artsy thing and, you know, have the girls get scared and, and, you know, snuggle. And we all spent the night, took sleeping bags and spent the night up there. Oh. Used glow sticks cause we didn't want to have fire. So we had a bunch of glow sticks and, you know, left those on all night. We all had flashlights and we went all over that place. Oh man. We Tell me about all, it. Tell me about it's it. Actually, well, there's like four floors and then, you know, the very top is the, the open part and the roof was actually a place where they, uh, were, were the most sick people back when it was the, what was it? Emphysema or something, something had to do with the lungs. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody was there, you know, the whole United States, half of them were dying from it or whatever it was. And tuberculosis. Tuberculosis. And, uh, you know, so that's where they would have them upstairs outside. So it was kind of like you had, all you had was the, was the brick of, of that part of that wing, the opening of it. And we kind of stayed underneath there. And I mean, I didn't, I didn't see anything. I didn't see anything, but it was, the whole thing was definitely a creepy experience. And we thought we saw things, but then, you know, it was like, well, that's cigarette smoke. I mean, we're talking 15, 20 years ago when, TV shows didn't tell us all the etiquette of ghost hunting. Right, 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 right. So we were just a bunch of kids in denim jean jackets running around, long haired, being stupid. We used to, uh, there was a video game that was turned into a movie. I'm going to have to ask uh, Rita to post the name of the video game. I can't remember what it was uh, uh, that took place in this city. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, a big part of the video game, uh, there was like one, two, three of them. Uh, was going through uh, a hospital, you know, different is it floors. The, is it the game where all of a sudden a girl just runs across the hall? Yeah, it could be, could be yeah. with, with the nurses that were all freaked out. It, yeah. was, it was made into a movie. I don't know why I can't remember the name of the game, but um, that movie or that video. Resident Evil, I think. No, no, not Resident okay. Evil. Uh, Rita will post it here in a second. Silent Hill. Yeah. Silent friggin' ill. That <laughs> video game messed with my head so bad because we would play it in the dark at night and and the sound effects and, and the music and everything else. Well, anyway, um, Waverly, I, I don't know if I could do Waverly at night because uh, after playing Silent Hill. So is Central State still... Still open when you moved out from Indianapolis then? Yeah, um, I that was Reagan years. Reagan yeah, shut it down. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh Central State was still I'm I left Indy in eighty three. Well, Reagan shut it down and now that place is like Waverly. Really? It's completely abandoned. Yeah. And that's just like downtown Indy. Yeah, know? I remember uh when uh just uh seeing Central State when I was a kid looking at it and people you know, telling you about it and you're looking, it was a, you know, it's a, a health. What, what's the technical term for it? Uh, you don't want it was to, a, it was a, well, the, the untechnical is it was a cracker factory. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, right, 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 right. Um, psychiatric hospital. Is that the way yes. to put yes, it? Yes, sir. Yeah. And, uh, and so to thinking about who was inside and when you, when you went by, when you're a little kid, that would freak you out because you always hear about it and see movies and stuff like that. I well, I've been in that place too. You can get there through the smokestacks. <laughs> so you can get in there. You can get in there through the smokestacks and they got tunnels and everything. Has uh, not supposed to be there. Well, know, but... And that's what I'm saying. I couldn't do that after silent Hill. That stuff is <laughs> off limits to me, man. I, there's no way when I watch uh, ghost adventures and I love Zach Bagans. And when I watch Ghost Adventures and, you know, locked in that place. Have you ever seen the movie? Uh, it's like um, Zach Bagans. It's a horror film. It's called uh, uh, Ghost. Um, 
Oh, it's it's a it's same thing. I think it, I think it might even be filmed at Waverly. It looks like Waverly, and they go. There through, is actually a couple movies have been made there. Yeah, it's one of those found footage films, and they go into the basement, and and the tunnels never end, never end, and and uh, they get stuck down there like perpetually forever, and they keep going. The tunnels never end, never end, never end. Eventually, their batteries die. After Silent Hill. And stuff like that. I'm serious. I would never, I, I just wouldn't do it. Maybe during the day, but not at night with uh, the lights off and it, with a video camera with the night vision on going down one of those hallways. I would never do it. No, no, <laughs> no. And, and, oh, I've only had one experience in my life, and I called in and told you about that one. So, I mean, really, and that wasn't too scary. So, that stuff doesn't bother me because I've I've only had one, like, experience just out of the corner of my eye kind of thing right 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 well you know, there's um there's also there's a hospital here in la that's been abandoned for a long time i can't remember the name of it it's downtown and uh ghost adventures went there and they're going through the and it's just like silent hill where there's like a wheelchair in the hallway there's a gurney over here and they go into a room and there's still you know, uh, beds in there and just, 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 yeah. That wheelchair no. is creepy from the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That's, <laughs> that's why what it's I'm so talking. creepy you to see, see one like that. That's exactly what I'm talking about. So I don't know. I don't, would you go, uh, even as an adult, would you go back to Waverly now and spend the night? Yeah. Yeah, I would. I would. I would. I was, now, now they got electricity and whatnot and the places, you know, yeah, a little bit more run up, but I, I would. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, I mean, it's 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 like taking a girl on downtown canal. It's such a cheap date, you know. Just grab a girl and go down to Waverly, and, and we're gonna. All all you need is a bottle of wine and a and a sleeping bag and and a couple packs of cigarettes, and you got a night. You right, know? right. Yeah. Um, uh, Leslie just posted Loma Linda. I believe you're right. It is Loma Linda Hospital downtown, and uh, it's a it's a creepy place. And yeah, Waverly though, you just look at it from the outside and you just know it's bad news. Can I uh can I throw out my political observation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Quick? yeah, go, All go. Right. So so I was thinking about and, and I know a lot of people are gonna hate me for what I'm getting ready to say. But uh originally I I did watch <coughs> with apprehension the reporter who uh, was beheaded. And at first off, I think you know, it, the the fact that they faded away right before they did it was kind of strange and who cut somebody's head off with a pocket knife instead of a big knife. And then the very end picture looked kind of Photoshopped. So that's my opinion. Hate to say it, but that's out there. Well, it ties in, it ties in with what I'm getting ready to say. Okay. Uh, so, by, but, so, well, before you say that, I, I, I got today at least five emails all with the same comments. And so there you, you're not, you're not alone in this. And I did respond back uh, to a bunch of those emails um, so yeah, uh, you're not, you're not alone in, in these thoughts. Okay. Now go ahead. Continue. So there, so, so, you know, that's used as ammunition of why we need to be over there, why we need to be involved, why, right. why we need to be involved in another war. Okay. And it's all because people are doing bad things. Guys with brown shirts or black shirts, and usually it's brown shirts. We usually go kill brown people with brown shirts, but whatever the, this British guy, you know, it's, it's all evil. We got to do something. Now it's on the news. Now it's always being talked about. How come when you look in America and the Mexican cartel and their drugs and they're doing the exact same thing, they cut people's tongues off and take pictures of it and do all kinds of, you know, horrible, horrible things that are gruesome and bloody. And they show everybody don't mess with the Mexican cartel because we'll do that. Uh, how come we don't have to go fix that? Interesting way to look at it. And uh, well, I'm going to say. I'm going to answer that two ways, and I'm going to put my logical head on first, or my logical hat. Um, and we've all heard the stories: fifty heads in a ditch, you know, uh, across the border, and you know, in 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 Mexico. Yes, and and the stories are horrible. And I, you know, fourteen year old assassins, you know, going around doing this crazy stuff down there. But um, what they're not trying to do is take over. And this is my logical head in that they're not trying to overthrow the Mexican government. They're not trying to establish the state of cartel. And so it is, it's drugs. And I'm not saying it's right, 
But I'm saying if we're going to have uh, not only that, but the Mexican government too as well, it's going to have an excuse for it. I guess I suppose that that would be it. They're not trying to overthrow the government. And it seems that um, everybody. I think it's because we make too much money. Well, it could be that. Well, yeah, of course. The, you know, that's part of it too as well. Um, there's there's money changing hands. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's a whole nother subject. But also they tend to be, it seems like most of the time they're killing each other. You know what I mean, and so that that's also part of it. Um, now, if, but aren't but aren't these other other countries? And I'm not trying to be you know uh, to interrupt you, but aren't these other countries killing each other? Aren't they at war with each other? And they're on the same continent, so they're basically the same people, even the same color and everything. Well, if ISIS was killing ISIS, you know, you know what I mean. That <laughs> ISIS is just an acronym, though. ISIS is an acronym that America puts on place because you can market it. You can market the term ISIS. Yeah. Instead of saying terrorist, yes. it's a marketing yep. franchise brand. Right. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm totally with you. Um, and, uh, now back to, and I'm totally with you. And is there an excuse for us to? Uh, react a certain way with what's going on there and not react the same way with what's going on directly on our own borders too as well. Um, yeah, that, that's not right. That's a good, that's a really, 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 really good point. Um, yeah, I have no idea. I, I've thought so many times when you hear about these horror stories that, that, you know, what goes on in some of these border towns, you know, between Texas and Mexico, um, that this stuff goes down, how, how lawless is it really? You know, why can't we just, not only us, but the Mexican government go in and, and wrestle control of all of this? I, it's beyond me it, because it's maybe right it's here in not, our backyard. Maybe it's not really as bad as what we hear because if it was, you know, they'd kind of be like, well, you know, we're going to close the borders off and sorry, Americans, you can't, can't go over, you know, can't, it's, it's, we're going to decide that it's a little too dangerous for you. I mean, why not? All of our other civil liberties are taken away. Right, right. What's right. to say? Oh, it's too dangerous. They're killing Americans. They're cutting off, cutting off each other's heads. They're right. You know, doing whatever. Well, down in um, I used to. I haven't been there in a long time. Uh, you know, ten years. But I used to go down to Tijuana a lot, and 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 uh, even south of Tijuana, and I loved it down there. I did. I love Tijuana. I love going down. I never felt threatened or, or anything. You always hear these stories. You never want to wind up in a Mexican jail, man. You know, you don't want to, well, you don't want to be somebody, I, somebody tried to sell us a sister in Tijuana. Uh, <laughs> well, a sister. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. You know, but I, I always had a good time down in Tijuana. Always. Yeah. Did. It's a blast. Always. I like the fact that you have to do a shot or pay a cover charge. <laughs> you got to love it. Hey, Michael, man, all the best, my brother. Thank yeah. you for taking my call this evening, Mr. Church. For everybody in Naptown, tell them I said hi. I will, I will. I'll talk to you. Thanks, Michael. Good night. Let's just go one into another. Thanks, Mike. Always uh, always a great call. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black with Jimmy Church. Who's calling? Where are you calling from? Uh, this is Steve from Richmond, Virginia. Steve from Richmond, Virginia. How are you tonight, Steve? Doing well. How are you? It's a it's a great night, and I love it when I just hear about these scary places. I I, I don't know why, but it is always great conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I got one for you. Give it to me. Great. So uh, Steve from Bluefield actually may have heard about this. I grew up kind of in the uh, the same relative area that he did down in uh, the southwestern part of Virginia, and. Um, there was a house that was, you know, known to be haunted down there. And, uh, back in the seventies, a uh, son had killed his mother and father down there. And, uh, you know, as, as kids, we used to, uh, go and sneak in a back door and just check the place out. And, uh, you know, they, they had left everything there the way that it was. Um, at, uh, one time that, uh, that we went there, we grabbed kind of what used to be a flower arrangement that, you know, so it's something along the lines of, you know, we miss our beloved mother or something like that. Um, you know, stole it, took it back to the, uh, to the apartment that, that we were all staying in. And, uh, a few weeks later, the house burned down and, uh, that flower arrangement just absolutely disappeared. Never saw it again. Nobody had been in the apartment, just gone. What? 
explain that again. All right. So <laughs> we, uh, we, that's, oh, that's, uh, that's, it's un, it's unbelievable. Okay. To, to start from the beginning. You, you got to okay. the end so quick. Okay. It, 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 give that to me one more time. Okay. So the house, we used to sneak in the back door. Right. Um, you know, they had left everything the way that it was. You know, there's furniture in there. Right. Um, you know, typical house. Um, I guess from the mother or the father's funeral, there was what was a flower arrangement. Obviously didn't have any flowers. Um but it said, you know, we miss our beloved mother. Right. Something like that on there. Right. Um, no one had been there forever, so we decided that we were going to take that. This is kind of proof that we had uh, gone we in. Had gone in, right. whatever. Yeah. Right. So we took it, uh, went back to the apartment that we all stayed at, and kind of set it up just, you know, as a trophy, whatever. Um, a few weeks after we had taken it, the house itself... Uh, burned down. When it burned down, uh, the flower arrangement that we had had set up in the apartment disappeared. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And nobody, nobody got busted. None of your friends, nobody got caught. Nobody acted guilty. It just disappeared. Yep. Absolutely. Actually, no one was staying in the house. Um, it was, uh, you know, I guess during college, whatever, nobody was at the apartment. So um, when we came back, it was it was gone. And no one fessed up to it. This must be about 15 years ago. Still, nobody's fessed up to it. So There was, uh, I think all of us growing up, we always had a house somewhere that was, you know, um, abandoned that we could get into. And in Indianapolis, um, and everybody, all of my friends out there that, that are listening right now, they'll know exactly the house that I'm talking about. I went to uh, uh, two different schools there, uh, elementary school, which was PS 102, and then junior high was across the street on 38th Street um, and in, in between Post and Germany, or in between Post and Midhofer called PS 103, junior high school. And um, now to get to the the school off of 38th Street, there was a, a path, um, uh, uh, asphalt. It wasn't dirt. It was an asphalt path that went through these woods and went to the back entrance of the school. On the other side, it went through these woods. Uh, the school itself sat on the other side of the woods and was part of a subdivision that was over there. Okay. But our subdivision, on the other side of 38th Street, we had to walk through this path through these woods. That was creepy enough, right? But when you're walking through, and it was probably a quarter of a mile, you know, a decent walk through the woods. Um, and when you were walking towards the school to your left was this house out in the woods. And it was your typical brick, one-story house. And it looked like somebody lived there, but nobody did. But, I mean, it didn't look like the windows were broken and, and stuff like that. And yeah. one day, me and me and my buddies, we decide to go over, like, lunch hour or whatever. We're going to go over to this house. So we, we cut off the path and we walked through the woods. It was back in the woods uh, a ways. Um, so anyway, we, we get over and we get to the back door and we break in and we go in and it was just like you're describing. There was still furniture in there, but it was old. I mean, it was, you know, nobody had lived there for a long time, but we went into the living room and, uh, it was wooden floors and in the middle of the, uh, living room floor where there was no furniture was a giant black spray painted pentagram on the floor right and i looked and me and my buddies we you know i was probably in 7th grade and and we looked and now i i don't know it doesn't matter but we saw that and we ran out that back door 
and never went back to that house. <laughs> never went back. Never went back. And uh, every time I would walk to school in the morning and I would look at that house, I would just, I would walk a little bit faster. You know, I would just, I, at night, I would just walk a little bit faster through the woods. And that house just always freaked me out. And anybody in Naptown listening to this that went to PS 103 knows the house that I'm talking about. I'm sure it's, you know, those woods are gone now. I don't know. I have to go to Google, Google Earth and check it out and see if, uh, see if it's still there. But, uh, and the path that went back to, uh, PS 103. But yeah, that, so uh, I know exactly what you're talking about, except we never took anything from the house. We, uh, <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't do anything that foolish, but uh, yeah, there was that giant pentagram. And I would, and, and, and I, we, at that age, knowing what I know now about what a pentagram represents and what probably went down in that house, I would have been totally freaked out. I only knew it from like a couple of scary movies that the pentagram you know, was just a bad thing, but yeah, there it was. That, that and metal records. What's that? I said that and metal records. Yeah, right, right. And it was, it was probably like ten feet. I mean, it was massive. It was massive. And there was, uh, I remember there was like uh, some spray painting on the wall and stuff. But we didn't hang out. We walked in. We knew we shouldn't have been there. We probably were only in the house for like one minute. We got into the living room, saw that on the floor, and we turned around and bolted. We were freaked out. I mean, I'm serious. I couldn't even. That house just terrified me. I just walked past it like it. Oh, yeah, unbelievable. Yeah, there were all kind. There were there were some other strange things that happened at that house, but um, nothing nothing that weird. You know, um, you know, groaning kind of sounds and and stuff like that, but. Um, nothing as weird as uh as a flower arrangement different. yeah that's that's pretty crazy that's pretty crazy and uh I, knowing your experience i wish i would have thought about i, I was young but i would have yeah maybe gone back and and checked out this house a little more and like you were saying you know take something from it yeah that's pretty cool that's pretty cool and then have it disappear like that that's that's pretty trippy did yeah. you did you ever suspect one of your friends or what did you guys uh, and uh, I mean, I guess the conclusion you came to is, uh, mom or dad, uh, came back and took it. If well, you know what no, I mean. They're, they're, uh, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Um, I mean, that's, that's the only thing we could really come up with. Um, I, uh, my, my friends aren't very good liars. So, uh, I think I would have, <laughs> would have known we would have suspected somebody, but you know, that's, uh, that's the only thing that seemed to make sense as, as strange as that sounds. Somebody just, uh, George Ray Aruda just uh, tweeted, there's a big difference between a pentagram and a pentacle. They look similar, one point up versus two points up. Now, yep. I what I'm referring to is I'm referring to, maybe I'm even calling it the wrong thing. I'm referring to like the star with the circle around it. Yeah, it, it depends on whether it's uh, it's pointed up or pointed down. Well, how do you know um, if it's pointed up or down if it's on a living room floor? Well, I guess that uh, that would have to do with whatever ritual they were doing and which which way they were coming into the room. Right, right. Good so point. So to you, I guess it wouldn't matter, but to them it would uh, represent something different. Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> I don't. I didn't even think about that. I don't know much about it. So, hey, Steve, yeah. thank you, man. And uh, first time caller, but call back anytime. Great. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. Bye. Let, let's go from one to another. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black with Jimmy Church. Who's calling? Where are you calling from? Jimmy, it's Alex Mistretta. Hey, Alex. Great to hear from How you. Are you? Uh, I'm waiting for my updates, man. You got so much stuff you're posting right now. Yeah, I'm on a roll. <laughs> yeah, you are. I got, <laughs> this is Alex. I got, uh, Hold on. Let me let me uh, introduce you correctly. This is Alex Mistretta from UPARS, formerly lead investigator of MUFON, Los Angeles. And uh, I've been I'm, I'm seeing uh, a couple of things that, uh, well, I'll let you. Uh, let, me, let me hand it right over to you. Uh, what have you got going on right now? What's the updates? I was going to give you a little update on the, some of the pictures with the, uh, from the Point Doom 
investigation. Oh, yeah, that you sent out for uh, analysis. Analysis. Okay. Correct. What, what have you got? Uh, so far, well, one thing, I'm meeting with those guys on Saturday for a little more in-depth analysis, but so far, you know the one picture of the object out in the distance that seems to be coming in or out of the water? Yes. They're extremely impressed with that. And they can confirm, no, it's not a free speech, something that's out over the ocean. What did you think? And, uh, well, okay, well, um, I, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. Okay, what? Oh, no. What did you think well, about sorry, what did you think about those pictures that uh, were just posted with the uh, airline pilot flying between Hong Kong and Alaska, the glowing red disc um, in the Pacific Ocean? Did you see those? Yeah, I saw those briefly. I haven't had a chance to really go over them that closely, but they look pretty impressive to me, especially you know when you get a picture from airline pilots. Those are not you know idiots. No, they're they're not, and. Uh, I had originally mentioned that I, you know, I was thinking volcanic activity, but then somebody, actually a few people corrected me on this, that if it was volcanic stuff, it would be too deep in the water to even see from the surface like that. What we are looking at in those pictures is stuff that is really close to the surface. Um, they all look the same size. They're all round. I've had a bunch of um, uh, people uh, email me different types of glowing fish and uh, starfish, octopus, uh, you know, different things that glow in the dark, yeah. um, all possible. But the thing is, for me, uh, those pictures were lighting up the ocean. It's one thing to have a glowing object, but, I mean, that it was lit up. I mean, it was lit up. I can only... If you were swimming in that water, it would be like daylight. You know, I mean, it was uh, really yeah. lit up, illuminated. So, uh, okay, so what else have you found out about uh, Lori's pictures? Uh, that's pretty much it so far. Those guys are still looking at it, and they want to meet with me to discuss it uh, further. Uh, a lot of the other pictures, quite honestly, they had a hard time telling exactly what uh, they were looking at. They, uh, they found them curious, but they couldn't tell me exactly if they were objects or they were reflections, but... Those guys are pretty conservative, you know, overall. But the, uh, that, that one, you know, silver object coming out of the water, they were pretty much blown away by that one. So Yeah, that, that one is, you know? yeah, that is obvious, obviously either something egressing or, you know, it's something is coming or going from the water. Um, yeah. It, it, it's kind of hard to tell. Uh, the water looks disturbed, so it looks like it's leaving the water, but it also... It, it could be following something else into the water, you know. So I, I it it kind of looks both ways to me. Like there could have been a couple of objects there, one following the other, or it's something coming yeah. out of the water. But it doesn't. The way the reason why I say that is because it doesn't look like there's a big amount of. It doesn't look the water doesn't look like it's. Um, it looks like it's going in the other direction to me. So it looks like it's going into the water and maybe following another craft. I mean, that's, I know it sounds weird, but uh, the way I'm trying to describe it, but you have to see the way the water looks. We've all seen stuff, yeah. you know, come in and out of the water when you're playing in the pool, you know how the water splashes different ways and it looks like it's going in to me. It looks like it's following something into the water. So Alex, now, oh, Rich, yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, so well, you know, one thing I wanted to mention real quick is now originally the pictures were sent out to MUFON, who called the object a frisbee on on the beach. So I can eliminate that right off the bat. It's not the object is definitely not on the beach. No. I just wanted to clear that up because I thought it was a little responsible for them to just come out with that analysis and you know call it a frisbee. Well, with you know, and it's tough to just say MUFON. You know, we're talking about a specific investigator for MUFON that that would make that claim. Not everybody would come to the same conclusion. Um, but yeah, I hear you, um, Alex. In in keeping with the theme of the show tonight, what is the scariest place that you've ever been? The scariest place doesn't have to involve a ghost, but what was the scariest place? That even you, big guy, was just had the crap scared out of him. What What's the scariest place you've ever been? My very first investigation, 50 Berkeley Square in London. Uh, for 
brief and brief uh, story. It's uh, it's a place where at the turn of the century it was called the Whore of Berkeley Square, where uh, it was an abandoned house. People would go up there and people would be found dead, or there was not a hospital guy actually jumped out of the window. And uh, it's pretty famous, and you know, in ghost circles. So anyway, at age twelve, I was in London. I decided to go over there by myself, and it was uh, a bookstore. And um, but I snuck up to the second, the third, and the fourth floor, which were closed. But you know, I was twelve. I was going to snuck up there. I shall would probably do it again now, as an adult. Right. Um, knowing the history of that place, I was the only time probably that I was ever scared. In investigation, you know, probably because it was my first one. And I was twelve. Knowing that people had died up there, uh, there was even a case where someone was found dead, and there was a bullet hole with a bullet in the wall, and they couldn't figure out what he shot at. And all that in the back of my mind, I was going up there, and I took a lot of pictures, and none of them came out. They all came out as like there was like all this myth in this veil. Uh, and it's kind of in the middle of the stairway, in the middle of the hallway, and it just it just had that feeling, you know, of well, really I, heavy feeling. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and I've seen a couple of apparitions since then, and I didn't really see anything at that point. But just for whatever reason, it was one of the only times where I felt something was wrong. Well, tell me about the the picture that you posted recently of the mystery girl. Where you guys were yeah, out in the girl. woods? Yeah, because I looked at that picture. I blew it up. I looked at it a, a lot. And it's... Uh, it's somebody standing there and it's obviously female with long hair um, dressed, but yet, and the way that the picture is, everything is cool except for her. She's just a little out of focus and a little incorrect where yeah. it, it definitely, if there is ever a ghost in a picture, um, this is one of them, but you took this picture yourself. So tell me about that. I, I, I read your description about it but uh, and your story, but, uh, but tell us, how did that picture get taken? Who was with you? And that is one of the creepiest pictures, by the way, I've ever seen. Uh, congratulations. Well done. That's the best picture I've ever taken on the field. Yeah, this picture was taken about 10, 12 years ago. I was in Brittany in, uh, in France. I was with uh, actually my mom and stepfather, who are also investigators, and we were doing some research uh, on actually the Holy Grail, which had nothing to do with this picture whatsoever, but that's what we were there for. And while during this investigation, we found out about this forest where people were claiming to see apparitions, strange lights up in the sky, that sort of thing. People are disappearing. So we decided to take a long walk. And this was about an hour and a half into the walk. We hadn't encountered anybody else on the walk. This was kind of like the, the fall of starting to get a little bit cold. And um, so we're walking down this path, and there's a little stream. And, you know, because I knew the histories of that place, I was taking pictures just all the time. And we stopped there for about 20 minutes. For, for whatever reason, my mom starts feeling uneasy. And she's slightly psychic. And she, you know, sometimes I see, like, writing on her arm. I can actually see letters show up on her farm. And because she felt uneasy, you know, we stopped looked around, took some pictures, and you said there's only one path. There's only one way in or out. Where the girl was standing, behind there was a cliff, so there's no way for someone to come from that direction. And essentially, she was next to uh, this little river, which you could see on the 35 millimeter, which I have right here. She was actually a little bit clearer on that. And I just took some pictures out of the stream, to the left of the stream, to the right. I had no idea there was anybody there whatsoever. And we moved on. And it wasn't until, you know, we got the pictures developed that there she was. She showed up on the picture. What was unnerving is that it really seems that she's looking at us. She's like staring straight at the camera. I just posted it. I just tweeted it right yeah. now. Uh, at J Church Radio, hashtag DM Radio Net. That's where you head over to the sandbox, everybody. Yeah. You can see the picture here. And I'm, I'm telling you, it is a, a truly creepy picture and you knew you were alone with your friends there was nobody else there at all 100 percent. it was impossible for anybody to walk by without us seeing it one path nowhere to go we were there for 20 minutes so i, I was i mean 100 percent sure 
See, this is the thing. When you look at this, what I tried to do is I tried to de- debunk it. Okay. Maybe it's a tree stump. Maybe yeah. it's a bush. Maybe it's, uh, uh, you know, maybe, uh, maybe, no, it's a, it's, it's, it's a female apparition in the woods looking at you. And that's a, that's a creepy picture. It looks like almost she, like she has red hair. Which, yeah, she does. You can see in the, uh, original 35 millimeter, which I'll bring to you and you can check it out. It's a, it's a, it's a lot clearer. You can really tell that you can see her nose or mouth, the whole deal. And I don't have a scanner right here, so it's not the best copy, but you know, I'll show it to you. It's, I just know it's a girl. It's, you know, it's, or whatever. It looks it, like a girl. And she's dressed in black too. And she doesn't look, uh, what's the, I don't want, I don't want to put too much into it, but it's such a creepy picture. She doesn't look, uh, she, she's checking you out. She doesn't look happy. She's kind of slumped over a little bit and she's just, uh, looks like she's looking at the camera operator. That's what uh savage sock just posted. And, uh, yeah, everybody is coming. It's, it's just a, it's a, it's a fantastic picture. It's unbelievable. How did you feel when you found, when you saw her knowing that you were, you guys were alone out there? Well, you know, I was like, this is really cool. This is one of the best pictures I've ever seen. I was strangely, you know, I was really excited. Like I said, my mom had said that, uh, uh, were with me. They're a little more disturbed by it, especially my mom. I think it, it bothered her a little bit. She's a little more sensitive to this type of thing. I think the most unnerving part of it is you're right. It was staring right at us. You can tell the picture. I mean, it's staring at the camera or at me. I'm the one who's taking the picture. So it was aware of us being there. And that adds a whole other level to the experience. And so, and your parents, they knew you guys were alone. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it pretty much, yeah, they were freaked out when they saw the picture. And the, and, you guys weren't out there looking for ghosts. You guys were just sightseeing. Yeah, I mean, you know, we'd heard that, you know, this particular forest that had a lot of strange, you know, apparitions throughout history. It's, you know, I mean, but a lot of it was myth. So pretty much just that would, you know, take a nice walk in the countryside where we were really expecting to see anything. I was just taking a lot of pictures just in case, like I always do on every investigation. And, you know, stuff gold. <laughs> totally. Totally. Um, everybody's commenting on it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty creepy pick, man. And like I said, I looked at it, uh, when you first posted it and I'm, it, it, it can't be anything but what it is. Now, if it was, if it was a real person in the woods, okay. All, all right. Because that's what it is. It's obviously somebody standing in the woods, but you didn't see this person standing in front of you when you took the pick. And that's the point that we're trying to uh, drive home here. You guys were alone is my point. Yeah. I mean, we literally were there for 20 minutes at that very spot, you know, and cause we were resting for a little bit as well. You know, my mom had said that a little bit older. So it's, we would have seen somebody coming in and out. There's one path. It was, I had no other way to explain it. And it's, it, I'm, I'm looking at it now and you know, the lights are off here in the studio and it's just a, it's just an eerie pick, man. Well done with the black clothing, she, with the black clothing doors. He, does he think there's a connection between ghosts and shadow people? I'm throwing that back to you real quick before you go. Um, I think, you know, shadow people, obviously a type of ghost, but I think there's a lot of different types of ghosts. There's a lot of, you know, that's a huge, that's a much bigger conversation. We don't have time for it. That's a big phenomenon, but it, it's related. Yes. I don't think this particular picture relates to shadow people, but I think it's just something else entirely. Somebody just posted. She looks like she has horns. And I just, uh, so I just read that and I went back and looked at the pic. <laughs> she kind of does the, um, <laughs> of the one, go back and look and you'll see what, uh, what he's talking about. And, uh, that came in from William. It does kind of look like she has horns. And uh, that's the other thing. As time has gone by since you've taken this pick, do you recognize her now? Is this somebody that you knew, or has she ever shown back up, or it, no. it's just a singular event and that's it? It's a singular event. I, you know, it's 
so you have to assume it's tied into that place for whatever reason. You know, I don't think it, whoever she is, it doesn't look like she really wanted us there. Uh, you know, it's a feeling I get. Rita just texted and she said, uh, what were you taking pictures of? You were taking pictures of a waterfall or something? Yeah, there's a little stream to the right of it. We're actually taking pictures of the stream. And this is actually the uh, left side of the uh, 35 millimeters, so there's a lot more in the photograph. She was actually in the cold corner of the photograph. Right. Well, what you should do, send me, uh, everybody would love to see it. So when we're done with the phone call, send us the the whole picture because what you were taking, um, and I know the story, nobody, uh, they, they don't know what we're talking about. This is to the left. This is the very left of the picture. What you're taking the picture of is off to the right. We're only looking at a portion of the picture. We're looking at the left side of it. Correct. Okay. All right. We got a little delay going on here. All right, Alex, send send us the whole picture, and I'll I'll post it to everybody so they understand uh, and they can see the whole thing and see it in context, which makes it even okay. creepier. No problem. All the best, Alex Mistretta. Thank you, Alex. Hi, right, Jimmy. Talk to you soon. Bye. Alex Mistretta, you pars with his weekly update here on the show. Love it when Alex calls in. Uh, I can't wait to see, uh, I can't wait for all of you to see the entire picture. It's pretty creepy. Okay. A couple of emails came in scariest places. This one's from Renee. She says, oh, by the way, that opens up the phone lines, 323-825-5045. And you can also Skype fade to black 14. This is, oh, 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 just like that. Here he is. The man himself, Dino. How are you, Dino? Malibu to you, Malibu. <laughs> Malibu to you. <laughs> Someone suggested that. Okay. Um, I'm not too experienced in, in this area that you're the subject of tonight, but I love the Nazi week. Uh, couldn't call in last night. A cousin came by unexpectedly with his girlfriend, so I couldn't listen fully. After we listened to Jim Mars, everybody loved him, though. Yeah, you didn't listen with your cousin? Well, I, I, I'm just turning them on to, the, to him on to this, and his girlfriend got really into it, and I gave her a copy of my Whitley Strieber book, and she's an Aquarian, so she's into it. And I'm, I'm, br- I'm bringing people along. I've got a lot of converts since I've been listening to your show, and I turn them on to the show. That's, a, that's, how, it, that's how we do it, man. This is grassroots. You know, I, found, it, I truly feel I found a friend in you too, which is unusual to think someone calling from miles away would make have, a friend on the radio. You know, Dino, absolutely. But let me just say this: um, I have, I feel like now it's, it's, it, you know, the numbers are, it's, it's in the thousands. I have made wow. thousands of friends, and I know everybody, I, and and it's great. You know, with all of the emails and everybody that's on Twitter right now, there's going to be tonight probably a thousand tweets that fly through tonight or more. And after the show, I go back, I get caught up, I I read all of Twitter, I get caught up on all of the email, all of the phone calls that come in, all of the Facebook stuff. And I know everybody, you know, that's what it's, it's been one listener one friend at a time, and that's what it's all about. I love it. I, I, it's, it's the most humbling thing. I'm just completely honored. So thank you, and thank you for noticing because you're absolutely right, absolutely. So what have you got for me tonight, my friend? Well, there's just a lot of activity on there, and I've noticed it's gotten a little less intimate, but we all still know each other. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and you know, I had trouble. I just wanted to tell you I had trouble like a lot of people. I'm listening on external player. I can't seem to get to your page, and when I when I get to the page and hit live feed, it goes to an error page. So I hope yeah, well, I'll, I'll just refresh. Um, uh, this is what you have to do because I I had the same thing. I got email about it. Just go back and in, in your browser type in darkmatterradio.net, and then that'll clean out your old stuff, and you'll have the new web page in. And so it's a ca- it's a cache thing. That's an old yeah. page, and you brief you right. Done, okay, that explains it. Yep. Uh, okay. That that being said, um, I just wanted to say again. Several months ago, I think I emailed you about. Uh, well, Dan Aykroyd is one. I hope you're still working on getting him as a guest. And the other guy is Charles Hall. I want to hear 
about the the big whites. We keep hearing about the freaky uh, lizard people, and we keep hearing about the grays that everybody knows about. Can we get Charles Hall on? He's a nice man. Yeah, he's he's really cool. Thank you for that. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, I am in touch with uh, Ackroyd's uh, people, and um, I am trying to nail that down too as well. So, yeah, I, it'll be great. And next week we have some pretty cool stuff lined up, by the way. All right, while we'll be listening. I will be listening. It's the only thing that gets me so I can get up early in the morning and go to work thinking about what I learned the night before. Yeah, it was a pretty cool week this week. It was pretty astounding. And aside from Jim Mars, because we can talk about Jim Mars all night, and and Harry Cooper and Hitler living in Argentina and his evidence that was pre- presented to us. Oh, I'm convinced now. I always thought that was a bunch of bunk, but I think they might be. There might still be some Nazis. Now. Exactly. Now, out of all of that this week, though, there was one thing that stuck with me, and I reposted it today. Uh, I've got uh, some other images tomorrow that we're going to put up on the website, and then we'll have a little. Uh, little article with some information behind it was Joe Fex's picture from France. That picture from France, I think is one of the best UFO photographs of all time. And I, with the the tower in the middle of her, the tall. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No, 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 no. That's uh, that's bird. That's Admiral bird down in uh, Antarctica. No, this is a picture that was taken in France. And there's a lot, an old car in the foreground. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, okay. with the chalet and all that. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. That picture is freaking me out. So I reposted it today, and uh, and then Joe Fex sent us the original print um, with the border on it, and it's it's got like tape and stuff. But he, the original photograph itself, which is mm-hmm. fourteen mm-hmm. by eighteen inches. And oh, that, big, big it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why the picture is so crystal clear. He's done a really good scan of it. And, uh, but the more that I look at that picture and I look at, at what, uh, and when it was taken, that is, uh, that it, I think it's historical. And, uh, that's from this week, that right there, it's always about the evidence, you know, it's always about what is it that we're talking about then? What is the evidence? Well, in this situation, when we put this kind of evidence forward, you all you can say is now what? Okay, what have you got to say to this? You know, what is exactly. that in this that's picture? What, and that's what we're going to be seeing when you when you finally, and you don't tell us now, you tell us after you've done it in, at the Malibu underwater right. anomaly there. That's what that's what I'm going to be just even telling people at work about it because I won't be ashamed because there is some kind of evidence. Did you see the uh, video from you pars that we finally put up on YouTube? You, you know, I haven't had time. I'm going to watch it tomorrow night. Okay, yeah, just go over to the YouTube channel, everybody. the The video is up from you pars, and it says uh, the Malibu base uh, live full video at you pars. Um, go look at that in the second half. That's, uh, we didn't have video cameras. The video crew didn't get there till about an hour into the presentation. So the, the, the video picks up about an hour in we've edited the video down. So it's only about two hours, two and a half hours long. It's not full three hours, but, um, okay. so, so it's brought down, but if you go halfway into the video, that's where, uh, the video presentation kicks up and then, um, you can see all of the uh, um, all of the new stuff that uh, we've been putting forward. Go look at that. Look at the close ups. Look at the enlargements, and and that's uh, that's some pretty good stuff that is there. I'll do it the first chance I get. Now the girl, I don't know anything. It looks like a redhead in the picture. Yep. No one ever considered it could be like the blonde in the picture from a couple of nights ago. <laughs> it doesn't have to be. Ex- it could be an extraterrestrial if they do indeed. Some of these beings come to other dimensions. Why couldn't it be a redheaded alien? It's a they have pr- tall blonde. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. It's a creepy picture. And I'm picture. looking for these good-looking women. Now you got me freaked out every time. There are a lot of good-looking women near where I live, <laughs> and I look at a lot of them, and if they have kind of a distant look on their face, I go, could be an alien. Where is the creepiest place, the scariest place you've ever been? Okay, I'm not into this much. I'll tell you two quick ones. I was a kid, maybe about 12. We had a little a meal in the detectives club in my neighborhood, and we'd zip around. 
somehow one of the kids in our elementary school said, call this phone number. We could do, this is back when we had to dial up rotary phones, no answering machines. Um, so I don't know what the heck this was, but we would call this number. I don't know how we got a hold of it. And uh, you'd hear a lot of little, which today would be electronic. We didn't know electronics back then. It would be, and almost like someone told me years later, well, it could have been someone who was hard of hearing. But we would call up, and it was weird, and we would talk to it. It sounded like we thought it was our robot. And my friends and I would sit around after school, hey, where are you? And we'd make names and all. And one time we were playing around with whatever we'd called up on this phone number where it would, you know, maybe it was an NSA site back in the early 60s. But all of a sudden, a creepy voice got on the phone and said, don't call, don't call again. And it was just the creepiest thing, and we didn't want to call that number anymore. Oh, that's a good story. And then it, as an adult, <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, I was with a buddy who happened to be Native American. We went to Big Sur just for a couple of days and decided to hike back off Highway 1 to uh, about 12 miles back, which is about as far as I go. I'm, I'm a car camper, you know, when I used to camp. But we hiked back, and we just had a little day pack, and he was kind of slow. I said, you know, I'm a tall, skinny guy, and he. I said, "Man, for an Indian, you're sure slow." I told him, you know, <laughs> and he said, "Well, you're." He said, "That's because you have longer legs." So I said, "Well, look, I'll meet you up the way here." I said, "Because it, it wears me out." It was this really steep part of back in a canyon, you know, east of Big Sur, and you know, you would drop off. It had a lot of trees and shrubbery, but it would drop off down below. There might have been a creek or something, hundreds of yards below. I didn't want to find out. And then up above, so you had to stick on this little mule path that was maybe 12 inches wide. And once every hour or so, it took us a couple hours, you'd pass a hiker coming the other way, howdy and all that, but it was you were alone. And I, I will say it now, I shouldn't have been doing it, but I was young and restless, and I had a 22 pistol with me, right? And so did my buddy. So I told him, uh, I said, well, you know, when I get up the canyon, you know, pretty far enough, maybe I'll shoot off a shot. And if you hear it, you shoot a shot back, right? Right. So uh, so we did that, and we heard it echo through the canyon, and I stacked rangers not out here, you know? Right. And uh, so anyway, I got ahead of him. We, we wanted to spend the night out there. I said, I don't want to spend the night. There was a spring out there, a few naked people running around. I said, no, I want to go back to the to the truck, you know? So on the way back, I paced him again by about an hour. I got to this one area where it curved in. It was kind of, it was starting, not, it wasn't dark yet. It was not quite twilight. And I just got the strangest feeling that the hair on the back of my head, and I had a lot of hair in those days, kind of went up, and I just felt like I was being watched. I can't, I can't explain it. I, I don't need to get this way. I'm not a paranoid person. But I just, it was creepy, and it was so much that I thought of grabbing my gun, but I said, no, I'm just going to go faster. And I was sweating that three hour, but I kind of just hurried along that path, and finally when I went around the next bend, the feeling went away. Well, it became dark. My friend came in just after dark, and I, I happened to mention, I said, man, there was this one place a few miles out there, but, and he said, I know what you mean. He said, I think, and being an Indian, he said, I think an animal was watching. But to this day... It's just the creepiest feeling, and I don't know if it was an extraterrestrial, a Bigfoot, or, but something was watching us. There was, um, uh, if you remember, uh, Carlos Castaneda. Carlos Castaneda. Yeah. And, I took a course in college with him. It was called Anthropology of Religion, and we read all his books. We had this freaked out professor. <laughs> right on. Well, Carlos... One of his uh, first books, first or second book, um, I read uh, years ago. And I'll never forget, he had this one chapter about, uh, at the front of the book, about hitchhikers. Yeah. If you're driving down the road, uh -huh. yeah, never pick up the hitchhiker. Never, never, ever, ever, ever. Um, because it is death. You know, that was one of the things he suggested. You put him in the car and, you know, and so, but, but he tells this story in, in, in the book about driving down the road, sees this old man hitchhiking and I then remember. he, yeah, he's driving down the road. He doesn't pick him up. He's driving down the road a couple miles later. And the same guy is there hitchhiking. Yeah. And he leaves and how about the women. 
Yes. There was one. I, I, there was Journey to Ixland. There was uh, Alyaki Way of Knowledge was the first one, and uh, the Golden. Uh, the Golden Thread. The Golden Thread. Fact, yes. And what you had to do, the one thing I still remember to this day, is you protect your solar plexus because that's where the spirits come into you. You right, 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 right. Carlos Castaneda, man, is he still alive? No, he died several years ago. Some people said he was making those stories up. Other people said no. They really think that he went through and took training as a brujo uh, and that Don Juan really was a real uh, Indian that right. initiated him. Well, I remember um, uh, just fascinating reading, and I remember uh, in one of his books where he's down in, I, I think it was Mexico, but he's in the mountains, and he sees Don Juan fly and and take off and flew out across the valley and turn around and came back and, and land. I think it was Don Juan or a, 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 another Indian. Uh, yeah, it's another Brujo. Yeah, uh, flying around and, and just fascinating reading. Carlos Castaneda. And, they, and they, wrote a, they wrote a song about that. Who is that? Uh, there's a place out in Mexico. It's, it's, that, it's that song, Feels Like a Mystified. Who's that group? Fleetwood Mac. Yes, they. I think they wrote that about that. Book. Absolutely, they did. And uh, uh, the thing is, this is you know with 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 Castaneda, that chapter about hitchhikers, I don't do it. I I don't <laughs> pick up. I I don't do it. It's something that has stuck with me. Oh, uh, and everybody out there listening, going, dude, you know how many times I've needed a ride, and you probably passed me up. But exactly, uh, and back in the day in Northern California in the Bay Area, that was the thing to do. You never passed up a hitchhiker. No, no. Matter, matter of fact, I was told I was sacrilegious because I was a starving student, and I'd pick up people in my van and I'd say, "Can you give me twenty-five cents for the Golden Gate Bridge?" <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, Steve. Uh, Steve from Bluefield just uh, uh, tweeted. I've picked up more hitchhikers than I can count. I've never had a bad experience. I get that. I understand. I used to hitchhike. Hitchhiked all over all over Panama. I mean, we never walked. You know, wow. the thought of not having a car was no big deal. You just went out, side of the road, stuck your thumb out, somebody picked you up and took you where you needed to go. It was it was a, a way of life. I understand that. I do. I'm just saying Carlos Castaneda freaked me out with that chapter in his book. And you it's know, some... but in spite of all that, when I was in college, a couple of wonderful, uh, I'll call them liaisons with beautiful young women happened because I picked them up hitchhiking. <laughs> Easy, <laughs> Dino. They... Easy, Dino. Well, when I had my dog with I had, I used to have a beautiful Australian <laughs> shepherd, and they go, I can tell you're mellow, you'll do me no harm, and I never did. It was only love, love, love. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but that reminds me of something. Robin Williams, our dear departed friend, I got accused of being him back before he was famous because I picked up a hitchhiker in uh, over there across the bridge, Marin County. And this woman said to me, oh, are you Robin, the guy that runs the free bus service between uh, uh, Mill Valley and Tiburon? And I said, no. And she says, oh, I think he's, he's got curly hair, but I think his, his, he's shorter than you. And years later, that was the story that his mother told Barbara Walters when he was, she was being interviewed that he used to take his dad's car and put free free bus so he could meet girls. He'd, like, he'd shuttle them around. Uh, so, uh, Rick Sinnott just posted, uh, ask Dino if he knows about the albino colony in San Jose. I do not. Okay. All right. That's interesting. All right. Hey, Dino, thank you. All the best. It's never Malibu's right. With, to you. It's uh, <laughs> Malibu to you too, my brother. Thank you, Dino. Bye. Ah, Dino from NoCal. Subver- um, subversive Robbie. Uh, there's a killer on the road. His brain is squirming like a toad. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and um, I, I want to scroll back here. Uh, one of the coolest Twitter picks oh where is it i don't see it here hey re uh tweet me who is the um uh the twitter with the um the fader not patches on his shoulders uh tweet me that i don't see it here maybe he's changed it okay all right 
Uh, that opens up the phone lines, 323-825-5045. This is Fade to Black only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Take a quick break. When I come back, I'm going to read some scariest emails. I started with Renee, so I'll do that when I come back. Stay with us, everybody. This is Fade to Black only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Fader Night, 323-825-5045. What is the scariest place you have ever been? I'll be back right after this. This is William from La Crescenta, and I listen to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Jimmy Church. Church. My name is Alan, and I listen to JimmyChurchRadio.com. He's always giving it to you straight. JimmyChurchRadio.com. On the Dark Matter Radio Network. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio, the The Revolution. Revolution. Fade to Black, the spoke radio for the masses only. On the Dark Matter Radio Network. Just banging the calls. 323-825-5045. Just got an email from Lou. He says, I recall you saying you're going to have a former musician on Who with the Sun videotaped a triangle. Yeah, we had him on uh, a month ago. His name was Nick Menza. Shot that video right here in Studio City. We posted the video. We had the video up um, at uh, jimmychurchradio.com for quite a while, Lou. And uh, you can go back. I'll uh, re- can, uh, tweet the specific date that Nick Menza was on. Nick was on when we had, oh, I think that was the night that George Norrie called. Uh, Jason Martell. That was the show. That was Nick Menza. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black with Jimmy Church. Who's calling? Hey, it's Rick. How's it going? Hey, Rick. I, I, I thought that was your number. But, you know, <laughs> you just, you, you never know these days. Um, uh, maybe I was, you know, it's 702. It could have been art, you know. So, you know, you got to act, sure. you got to act nondescript. Yeah. Hey, hey, somebody just posted. I don't know if you uh, saw this. I'm going to scroll back. He says uh, he is, <laughs> where is this post at? That he's riding 100 miles an hour right now on his Harley listening to Fade to Black. <laughs> I think he said that's the scariest place I've ever been. And uh there you go, that was from Jonas. Uh, how did how how is he tweeting on his Harley at a hundred miles an hour listening to Fade to Black? Great, great or maybe it was man. maybe it was just the idea. <laughs> so no, I mean I've I've set my throttle lock at about hundred miles per hour in the desert and just kinda sat there with my arms crossed my chest before. And as long as you don't hit anything, you're good. You can pretty much control just, you know, your butt cheeks. <laughs> uh, you, know, you know, Rita and I are, are, are shopping for Harleys, and you tell stories like that, and she's just going to shut me down. Right now, I have a green light, Rick. Don't mess it up for me. Okay. Hey, she didn't shut you down after I showed her the video of that guy on the Hayabusa. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah, they're right. You're pretty good. Yeah, she knows. Yeah, I almost bought one. Uh, a Hayabusa? Yeah, I almost bought a Hayabusa, but uh, I bought my fat boy instead. Where's the scariest place you've ever been? Scariest place I've ever been would probably be this house I lived in in Fresno, California. <laughs> you lived in? Wait, wait, wait. Uh-huh. Stop, 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 stop. You lived in the scariest yeah. place that you've ever been. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're talking about screw it, right? Yeah, that ain't right. <laughs> no, I've, I've, like, like I said one night on uh, Twitter, I've had enough weird experiences where nobody would believe it. You'd have to split, you know, split everything among like five people to make it believable. Right, right. But, uh, but yeah, it was this uh, house in Fresno, California, when uh, I was a kid. We just moved in, and I had this really cool cat named Scuba. As soon as we got in the house, we set Scuba on the floor. The cat freaked out, ran right out, ran underneath the house. We never saw Scuba again. 
What? It never came out. Yeah, yeah. The cat freaked out and uh, ran underneath the house. We moved from uh, Lodi to Fresno. And think about it. We moved a lot. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we moved from, like, uh, Lodi to Fresno. And uh, the cat freaked out, ran underneath the house, never came back out. And uh, so Scuba was gone. The thing that happened after that is the way this house was set up is pretty much door ditch proof. You know, where you knock and you run. Right, right. So there's no way that you could really do that. So, you know, uh, it'd be about maybe once every other night, maybe like twice a week. Somebody would, you know, knock on the door. And then we had this big giant bay window. The window was open. My godparents were over, my parents were there, they never saw anybody. One night, knock on the door, my dad thought, you know, he's going to be Johnny on the spot, whips the door open, and there's this cat sitting right on the step, just looking up, you know, and the cat came right on in, put on the brakes in the middle of the kitchen, looked at my, my godmother and my mom, hissed, turned around, and ran right back out. What? I mean, just boom, boom, boom. Yeah. <laughs> but it gets better. Uh, <laughs> there's an unfinished uh, storm cellar in the house. So in the hall, we had this big door that you would lift up, and I had steps going down. But it didn't have the uh, exit on the other side. Like, you know, the old houses would have the storm cellar where you can get in from the inside, and they had the big double doors on the outside. Right. Well, it was unfinished. It only had the door uh, going into the inside. And my parents just used it as storage. And they would go in there like maybe once a month, maybe. And they had a big giant like, you know, carpet over it. So they pulled up and there were always cigarette butts on the first couple of steps. And nobody in the house smoked. And I was a little kid. Nobody in the house smoked, but whenever they pulled up, there were already there were always cigarette butts on the first couple of steps, like somebody sitting there smoking. Really? Yeah. Did you ever clean them up and then they would reappear? Yep. That ain't right. No, no, it's that not ain't right. right. And it, yeah, it was uh, it was non-filtered, so you couldn't find the logo on it. Oh, that's even. It's just like, yeah, yeah, something vintage. Yeah, it was like old school Lucky Strikes or something like that. But then again, that's just like late seventies. So right, right, you know, right. They were they were still a lot more popular, you know, than they are now. And uh, we'd have cabinets that would open and close. I had the bedroom downstairs, and I hated it. I absolutely hated this room. Freaked me out. I was always either sleeping on you know the living room couch or upstairs with my folks. I, did, I wanted nothing to do with this room. So one night, I had enough, went upstairs, uh, crawled in bed with my folks, you know, and, you know, now my daughter gets revenge for my parents because right. she doesn't want to sleep at night, you right. know. So uh, <laughs> I turned to my dad, and there's a closet door. Um, as you're facing their bed, you're standing at the foot of their bed. On the right-hand side, there was a closet, which is the way their bedroom was set up. Closet door was maybe open by about a foot and a half, two feet. I told my dad, "Can you close the closet door? It's really, it's really creeping me out. It's messed up." You know, my dad's like, "Don't worry about it. It's just a closet door." You know, I'm like, "No, please close the door. It's creeping me out." So he's trying to reach for it, you know, so he doesn't have to get out of bed. Do like the lazy, I'm tired. I want to go to sleep. So he's reaching for it. The thing slams. I mean, just like. Imagine out of his know, hand, almost, like at, be, before he touched it, he didn't, he didn't even reach it. His hand was about a foot away from it. Oh, that ain't right. And it seemed like the biggest, most pissed off bodybuilder in the world had like a roid rage and just slammed it. You know, wh why don't, why don't have entity? Why don't entities have respect? <laughs> why do they got to do it like that? You know what I mean? Well, you know, <laughs> that maybe, ain't right. Maybe, Maybe it thought that I disrespected it by saying that, you know, it creeped me out because it's like, you know, for all I know, <laughs> it's been watching us through the, uh, through the closet door. Or maybe it's trying to be accommodating to the whiny little kid. Right. You know, right, right. The door. 
But um, the next day I got up, opened up the door, and the paint it, it on the inside, and like, I would say about like a five foot tall by about three or four foot like oval was peeled off to the uh, layer of paint underneath it. Oh, really? Now, yeah. how do you, how do you the explain? The door was white. I mean, like stark white. How do you the layer of paint underneath it was like a cream color. How do you explain that? Yeah, yes. <laughs> you just reminded yeah. me. I'm waiting for uh, Les to call in the closer here, but uh, oh, here's Les. Les is going to join us. You ready? Oh, cool. Yeah, stay with yeah. us. Stay with us. Cool. What's up, Les? Hey, what's up, my brother from another mother? <laughs> hey, <laughs> say hi to cool, Rick. Huh? We we got Rick got on both too. My brother's on. <laughs> hey, check. Yeah, what's up, man? Check this How out, you doing, Real- Rick. Oh, um, I well, want. Go ahead with the story, Rick. Well, I, Rick reminded me of a story that is not uh, that it's not a ghost story, but it's a scary story. Check this out. There, there was a band in the '80s uh, called Every Mother's Nightmare. You guys may remember, may not, but uh, they had a couple of hits and and so forth. They were out of Memphis, and I'm over at their house when uh, when I spending the weekend over there goofing around. And uh, that the record company had paid for. So the whole band was living in this one house while they were recording their first album. And Rick, the singer, one day, everybody had record company money all of a sudden. You know, everybody in the band, you know, a little paycheck. Rick goes out and comes back with a python in a cardboard box. And it was, it was about, it was big. It was like you know, a, a, a 10 foot pipe, a, a big snake. And, uh, so it's in this cardboard box in the living room and Rick reaches in to take the Python out to show it to everybody. And it launches and bites his hand in between <laughs> his thumb. Check this out in between his thumb and his index finger, right? Just oh, clamp, the web, the clamp webbing, down. The webbing part? Yeah. Yeah. The webbing part. And he pulls his oh. hand out and he's like, ah, Ah, right, and the snake comes out of the box. He actually got it out of the hand. Of the, he actually got it out of the snake's mouth. Yeah, 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 yeah. So no, when he pulled his hand out of the box, the snake is clamped down on him. He's holding the snake up in the living room, and so anyway, the snake lets him go, and we put it back in the box, and that's it. We're done with the snake kind of thing, and um, and so we're we're doing our thing for the rest of the afternoon, and and we're watching some movies that night. And I get up and I go over the house is dark. We're watching videos in the living room and I go over and I open up the box and the snake is gone. (laughs) It's not in the box. (laughs) And, And we freak out and they're like, no way. And we turn on all the lights and we open up the box. And I swear Rick or anybody from that band listening right now, call in and verify this story. The snake is gone, gone. And we're freaking out and we're looking all over the house. We can't find it. All the lights are on and we're turning stuff over. We go and check the box like five times. You know what I mean? And Mm -hmm. the snake is gone. We had to sleep that night. (laughs) Think about that. It was the craziest night. Nobody slept. I remember waking up the next day. Nobody, nobody slept. You know what I mean? Getting up and, (laughs) We never found that snake. <laughs> never found the snake. Snake is gone. He bought it for like 500 bucks, you know, some crazy amount of money. And that snake, as far as I know, as long as I knew those guys, that snake never showed up. And that, my friends. In 1980s money, that was like 15, <laughs> that was like 1500 bucks. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's a true story, man. Albino or just a regular? Uh, I I remember it being like yellow and black. I only saw it that one time when it bit him, you know. And, <laughs> but uh, you wanted to see him, Jimmy. I don't know why. What compelled me to go and open up the box, you know? <laughs> and I just I remember looking in, and it was empty. I'm like holy crap! It it was it was in the middle of the living room floor. That snake got out in front of all of us, and nobody saw a thing, nothing, and it 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 escaped. But uh, it, it was a, like an episode of Jackass. <laughs> it was <laughs> a totally an episode of Jackass. Oh man, 
All right. Hey, listen, real quick, out of respect to Renee, I've tried to read this email like three times. Let, let's read this here. Oh, she says, the scariest place I ever went was a small private girls Catholic school run by a very strict and in some cases, obviously mentally unbalanced nuns that I was forced to attend against my will for four years. I got a great education, but it scarred me for life. Two fellow graduates who went on to become clinical psychologists have told me it's well known by mental health care professionals in that area that those students have a much higher rate of seeking psychiatric services. <laughs> that makes perfect sense to me. I went to an all boys Jesuit school. So yeah. Right on. Uh, let's see this one. Uh, I just went to California public schools. That was enough for me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, here's another one. This is from Brad, our friend, Brad. Uh, Brad says, this is Brad OG, Brad, by the way. He says, hey, Jimmy, another great week. Scariest place I've never been was a shower gas chamber at Dachau concentration camp in Germany. There was a chill that seemed to fill the air as soon as you were uh, where thousands had taken their last breath. I couldn't wait to get out of there. Yeah, headed out. He says, I headed out and found myself facing a row of furnaces that were built with a single purpose. It totally creeped me out. You know what? That's oh, man. I didn't need to read that email. Brad, that just scared me. Oh. You know, man, that darkness is so thick you can cut it with a chainsaw. You know, yeah. one yeah. of the yeah. one of the for me, well for all of us, I mean it's not just me, but when you see those black and white photographs of those concentration camps empty it, it, with people in it. And uh, that's bad enough and everything. But when you see it empty and you think about what, you know, or that what the yeah. one picture of the uh, train tracks going into Auschwitz, you know, and you see that and going through the gates and you know, that is about as scary as because that th- that's a real nightmare. That's real horror. Not to- not to mention all the forests that are around. They're usually devoid of, devoid of any type of life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they're always black and white pictures, too. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, hey, Les, the scariest place you've ever been? <sighs> well, the scariest place I've ever been would have to be my, uh, my grandmother and my great aunt lived in Clearwater, South Carolina. Now that's, you know, a hop, skip, and a jump from Augusta, Georgia, and North Augusta. Right. Uh, South Carolina. Uh, they had, every once in a while, I would uh, help out uh, my aunt because she was a double amputee due to diabetes. And they had a back room with a huge California king-size bed. And this back room faced, it, faced this forested area. And I don't know what it was, but every night... I would sleep in that place. It would creep me out. Now, I mean, I kept all the lights on. <laughs> uh, I kept all the doors locked and closed. Um, I, I don't know what it was, but it was the creepiest place I've ever been. Uh, my nephew, well, actually, he's a cousin, uh, actually used to talk about the little boy he talked to in the closet. Um, I never saw that. But it certainly creeped me the heck out. Yeah, you know uh, that's. I heard that. Yeah, and, and that's well, my that's point. Really you don't. Though. Yeah, you don't have to have ghosts. You don't have to have all of that to be in a totally scary place. You don't need that. I mean, th- think about it. Uh, going to some place like Waverly, or you know the, the way you know, it, it doesn't have to be haunted to scare the crap out of you. I think it had to do with Amer- uh, probably latent energy uh, used to be uh, Native Americans uh, used to be around that area. And uh, I think it maybe had something to do with that, maybe a protector spirit. Um, I really don't know, but it used to, when the light, it, when it got dark, it was fine during the day. But when it got dark, you could swear something was out there and it didn't like you. <laughs> that's it. That's, right. that's my scary story. <laughs> Did you ever research the place at all? No, I never really got a chance. Uh, but I'll tell oh. you, once my grandmother and my aunt moved out, 
it fell apart very, very quickly. What do you um, What like do you mean? Was, uh, it, the mold started growing on the walls. It started Ooh. becoming very decrepit. Uh, it, uh, it, it it's like there was never meant to be a house in that place. Um, and we still get together Thanksgiving, Christmas, and we always talk about that room. Every family member we have talks about that room. And it, it wasn't just me. It's, it's weird for, I know that, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, there's a lot of scary places. For me, the scariest place I've ever been was playing Silent Hill. One. <laughs> that had the, the best ambience. I love the beginning music to that. Oh, that music would just free when that when we would start playing that game and that music would start. It was just wrong. That 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 was a really and I remember uh, reading the reviews about the game, and uh, and Rita will tell you about this. I was I read the reviews and I t- I took it. And I said, Hey, we gotta go. We gotta go. Uh, we gotta go to Fry's today. We gotta buy this game. And, and I was trying to, you know, and I showed her the review and, uh, and the review scared you, you know, and I was just like, wow. So we were all completely psyched out before we got home, you know, and I remember we got home, we turned yeah. off the lights and we started playing that game and, uh, uh it was not uh, a light turner outer game. I'll it, say that. Yeah, no, no. And you just knew, I mean, some of the creatures, they really, the monsters in that game were just And the radio wrong. that would start crackling. Yes, 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 yeah. yes, 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 yes. The walkie-talkie would start to crackle. Uh, when it got, that the uh, one that had the air raid sirens? Uh, yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Oh. yeah, and they had that, that whole subway thing, too, as well. I mean, they had the mental hospitals, and they had the hotel, mm-hmm. and and uh, but uh, that whole subway, that... The subway section of the game took you like two weeks to get out of, and you were so scared by the. I mean, it was just insane. I, oh no, I died. I got to you know, go they, back to the subway. I don't want to go back to the subway. They've got <laughs> no. a brand new one coming out soon, and it's actually uh, for PS4 and PS3, probably. It's got, and I can't remember the guy's name, but it's uh, the guy that plays Daryl on Walking Dead is going to be the voice of the main character. Oh, is that right? I believe. I, I bet it's so. going to be. Yes, 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 yes. I bet it's going to be good. I bet it's going to. It's funny, but the the original Silent Hill, Silent, all three were really good, but that first one was a a, a revolutionary game, absolutely revolutionary. They, they couldn't match the the first one. They haven't had one out since that really matched the first one. Yeah, and the that, first one. It, it changed the whole genre. It yeah, did. It, it did. George Aruda just posted the music and sounds in Diablo, the dungeon crawl, were scary. He's absolutely right. Diablo one, Diablo two was pretty good too, but the music in Diablo was uh, absolutely terrifying. <laughs> Diablo scared me to death. That was a good game. All right. Hey, uh, Les, are you ready? Hey, Rick, stay with I'm us. I'm ready. Stay with us. Um, uh, Les is going to read the credits tonight. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. So I'm just going to say this at the front of everything. Just uh, thank you, everybody, for calling in tonight. Les, go ahead. Foremost, Jimmy wants to thank everybody who called in tonight. Stay tuned. Coming up next is Night Watch, followed by Spooky South Coast. Special thanks to Keith Rowland and Art Bell. Save the Black executive producer is Rita Kamurian. show is produced by Hilton J. Palm and Mark D. Kovar. The announcers are Steve Harder and Mark D. Kovar. And? You ready? Okay. You know what? I'll just say it. Coming up next. Music is by Doug Alder's show intro is performed by Space Boy. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This was Fader Night. Thank you, everybody. Have a great, safe weekend. See you. Thank you, Les. Thank you, Rick.